Seven. Blade peered through the curtain of rain, looking a few lengths ahead, to see if there was anything like a cave in sight, then looking back down at her feet to pick out her footing among the slippery mud and river rocks. Here out in the open, the rain came down in sheets, making footing doubly treacherous. More rain sluiced down the cliff face, washing across the rocks at her feet. This time they hadn't gone to ground when the rains came. They didn't even look for a shelter. Instead, they continued to make their way along the cliffside bank of the river. For one thing, the only shelter from the rain lay back on the other side of the river, and she didn't really want to take her chances back there. For another, every moment they spent in huddling away from the rain was a moment that they could not spend in looking for real cover, the protection of a place from which they could not be extracted by force. By now, poor Tad was a wet, sodden mess, and after this she was certainly going to have to figure out what they could spare to make him a new bandage for his wing. The bandages he wore were soaked and coming loose, and wouldn't be any good until after they had been rinsed clean and dried. Sacrifice some clothing, maybe, if we don't have enough bandages. I could shorten the legs of my trues for cloth, since they don't seem to be much protection against the bugs. That and some rope might make a decent sling. She was going to have to get him dried out before they slept. Allowing a griffin to go to sleep wet was a sure prescription for illness. We need a cave, or at worst a cleft. This rain is going to go on until nightfall, and we won't be able to see anything then. The water level in the river didn't seem to be rising much, if any, which suggested that it was probably as high now as it ever got, except in the occasional flood. And I hope we don't happen to be in the midst of flood season. There was evidence aplenty for a flood in the form of flotsam, mostly wood, washed up and wedged among the rocks. It would make admirable firewood if they could ever find a place where they could build a fire. It would be just our luck to have pinned our hopes on finding this cliff, only to discover that there is less shelter here than there was in the forest. If they didn't find a place to hurl up before dark, they might have to spend the night exposed on this rocky shore, where they would have the grim choice of lighting a fire and attracting attention or shivering, cold and damp, wrapped in wet blankets all night. The gods, or fate, were not to be so unkind, however. After a few more furlongs of picking their way across the rocks and sliding through the mud, the cliff receded somewhat to her left, and the river opened up before her. A white, roaring wall loomed up out of the rain, as if someone had torn a hole in the clouds and let all the water out at once. After a moment of blinking and trying to get her dripping hair out of her eyes, she realised that she was not staring at a torrent in the midst of the downpour. She was looking at a waterfall, and just on their side of the waterfall, there was a series of darker holes in the cliff wall that must be caves. Tad spotted them at the same time and shouted into her ear, If any of these are deep enough, this is where we should stop. We may not be able to hear anything coming, but whatever tries to come at us from ahead won't be able to get past the falls. We'll only have to guard in one direction. She winced at the bellowing, since she was right beside the excited griffin, but saw at once that he was right. That overcame her misgiving at camping in a place where the sound of an enemy approaching would be covered by the roar of the water, and as if to emphasise just what a good spot this was, a stunned fish came floating to their very feet to lodge among the rocks, flapping feebly. It had obviously been knocked silly by going over the falls, and Tad, who was probably starving, was on it in a heartbeat. Two gulps and it was gone, and Tad had a very satisfied look on his face. "'See what else you can forage!' she shouted at him. "'I'll check out these caves!' Wait a moment, he shouted back, picking up a milky white smooth pebble from the rocks at his feet. Tad stared at it in concentration, that she found very familiar. Then he handed it to her, Griff grinning with open beak. The pebble glowed with mage light. She accepted it with relief, at least he had enough magic back now that he could make a mage light again. She didn't have to go far to find their new shelter. The very first cave she entered proved to be perfect. It went back a long way, slanting upward all the time. For a few lengths the floor was covered with soft, dry sand. Then there was a pile of driftwood marking the high water line that past floods had also left behind. That was where the sand ended and dirt and rock began. A thin stream of water ran down the centre of the cave, coming from somewhere near the back, cutting a channel through the sand and rock alike. She made her way past it, holding the blue glowing rock over her head to cast the best possible light ahead of her without dazzling her eyes. The cave narrowed the farther she went back, then abruptly made a ninety-degree turn upward. This was where the stream of water originated. She put her head inside the hole and looked up. Besides getting a face full of rain, she clearly saw the cloud-filled sky a great distance above. 
at one time a real stream of water, perhaps a branchlet of the river, that tumbled down the cliff farther on, had cut a channel through here, forming the cave. Now, except perhaps during rain, that channel was dry, but it formed precisely what they needed, a natural chimney to carry the smoke away from their fire. Provided that nothing acted to funnel more water down that ancient outlet, this would be a perfect shelter. She could not have asked for anything better. Even the chimney was too small for anything threatening to climb down it, except perhaps snakes and the like. There were signs that other creatures have found this place just as congenial, a collection of small bones from fish and other creatures, and a cluster of bats toward the rear of the cave. She did not mind sharing this cave with bats. After her constant battles with insects, she was altogether happy to see them. They didn't seem disturbed to see her. Blade? Tad called from behind her, and she realized that although the sound of the waterfall did penetrate in here, it was much muted by the rock walls. Coming, she responded, turning her back on the chimney and climbing back down to the driftwood pile. She smelled smoke, and indeed a plume of it, ghost-like in the blue light of the bespelled pebble, drifted toward her and the chimney outlet. A warmer light up ahead greeted her. Tad had already started a fire with the driftwood, and she joined him there. The fish around here must not be terribly bright, he said cheerfully. Quite a lot of them ended up on the rocks a few moments ago. I got you some. He pointed with his beak at a pair of sleek shapes at his feet. After you ate your fill, I hope, she admonished. You need the food more than I do. I manage quite well on that travel bread. His nares flushed, and she judged by that and the bulging state of his crop that he had been perfectly greedy. Not that she blamed him especially not after going on short rations for so many days. You might as well put this under something so we can sleep, she said, handing him the pebble and shrugging painfully out of her pack. If I'd ordered up a cave, I couldn't have gotten a better one than this. We can even make a really smoky fire back there, she pointed to the rear of the cave. There's a natural chimney that'll send it up without smoking us out. The only thing we don't have is a nighttime signal. We need to talk about that. He ground his beak as he thought, his good wing half spread in the firelight to dry. I can't imagine them flying at night, he began, then laughed. Well, on the other hand, since it's me and you who are lost, Scandranum will have the night flights out if he has to fly them himself, she finished for him with a wry chuckle. Then her humour faded. She could not forget even for a moment that they were still being hunted. Until they knew by what and for what reason, they should not assume they would be here to rescue when rescue came. Yes, they had good shelter now, and it would be very difficult to dig them out of it, but not impossible. Not for, say, a renegade mage and his followers, human or created. Tad, however, was going to take the moment as it came. He shrugged out of his pack and nudged a fish over to her with one talon. You eat, he said. There's enough wood in here already to easily last the night. While you cook and eat that, I'll go back out and see what I can see. She hesitated a moment, then gave a mental shrug and bent to pick up the fish. I might as well eat and make myself comfortable. He's right about that. While the rain fell, it was unlikely that anything would try to find them. If the creatures trailing them were semi-intelligent, they would assume that the two castaways had followed their usual pattern and had taken shelter before the rain started. The hunters would probably be looking for them on the other side of the river first, especially if the hunters had not traced them as far as the river when the rain began. Any trail would end short of the river itself, and the mud and rock of the river bank would not hold any scent or footprint through the rain. The trail on the other side of the river would be completely obliterated, and if they could keep their fire out of sight, it was possible that they could keep their presence in this cave a secret for a day or more. By the time smoke got up the rock chimney and exited above them, it would be very difficult for anything scenting it to tell where it originated. After that, of course, it would become increasingly harder to stay hidden. Every time they left the cave, which they would have to do to catch fish, wash and get firewood, they stood a chance of being seen. Watchers on the other side of the river could spot them without being seen themselves. But I'll worry about that after I eat, when I can think better, she decided. It was wonderful to be able to have enough space to properly open the packs and spread everything out. Once again, though, she found herself attempting a task one-handed that was difficult enough using two. Scaling and gutting a fish. She wound up slipping off her boot and using a foot as a clumsy hand on the tail to hold it down. She saved the head and the guts for later use as bait. They could not count on having the kind of luck that sent a harvest of fish down over the cliff to their feet every day. That was all right. They had fishing line and hooks with them, and if the fish guts didn't work, she could try a bug, a bread ball, or a bit of dried meat. 
Once again, her shovel came into play as an impromptu grill. It probably would have been better if she'd had something to grease it with, but at the moment she was too hungry for trifles like that. The fish burned a little and stuck to the shovel, but that didn't matter in the least. She could scrape the fish meat off and eat, and some blackened fish meat stuck to it wouldn't adversely affect the use of the shovel as a shovel. She was hungry enough, in fact, that she very nearly burned her fingers, picking flaky bits of meat off the hot carcass before it properly cooled. She alternately swore softly and ate, making a happy pig of herself. Tad reappeared, dripping wet again, and regarded her thoughtfully. Clay, he said. Next time wrap it up in clay and bake the whole thing. When you break the clay open, the skin comes off with it, but the rest of the fish is fine. Where did you learn that one? she asked, looking up at him in surprise. Mother, she loves fish, and even though she likes it best fresh, she's been known to accept baked fish if it wasn't straight out of the sea. He griff grinned at her again, and cocked his head to one side. You know how she is. Unlike father, she'll wish for the ideal, but not complain when it isn't given. What do you want to do about the firelight? Move the fire back farther into the cave? The cave bends enough that I think that will make it harder to see from across the river. Or does it matter? So he had been thinking about their stalkers. I'm not sure it matters. Sooner or later they're going to see us or see signs of where we are. I'd rather put some thought into defences. I've set up some simple line snares on the path, so watch out for them, he said. Not much, there's not much I can do in the rain, but some. It should help, I would think. I can do better tomorrow. So that's why you're wet. She signed to him to sit beside the fire as she devoured the cooked fish. It didn't taste like much, a bit bland, which in itself made it an improvement over the dried meat, which tasted like old boots. It was hot and satisfying, and cooked, which made all the difference, and she had every scrap using her knife to scrape the burned bits off the shovel and eat them too. Then she settled back on her heels, sucking her slightly burnt fingers to get the last of the juices, and gave him all of her attention. Right then, let's settle the short term first, then the long term. First watch? she asked. Yours, he said promptly. As full as I am, I'm going to doze off no matter what. I can't help it, it's the way I'm built. And I have marginally better night vision than you do. I also have better hearing, he added. But with that waterfall out there, that isn't going to matter. I can run our fishing line from one of the snares into here, and stack some stones over the light pebble to make a sort of alarm. Well, that seems pretty reasonable to me. Good enough. If I see anything tonight, should I take a shot at it? Across the river is in the range of my sling, and with all these rocks around I can afford to miss now, and we won't have to go after my ammunition to get it back. That was another source of easing tensions. Now she was no longer limited to the pouches of lead shot for ammunition. The rocks might not fly as true, but she could lob as many of them around as she needed to. My vote is that we not provoke anything tonight, he said instantly. Let's not give them the answer to the question of where we went. If they can't find us tonight, we might get lucky and they'll go away. Probably not, but it's worth giving ourselves the chance. Agreed. Do we trap the other side of the river? That was another good question. It might well be worth it to try, or it might make them targets when they cross the river to check the traps. The river wasn't all that deep, even at its deepest, barely chin high on blade. Anything energetic enough could cross it easily. After all, they had, and neither of them was in the best of shape. A stealthy swimmer could cross it and never betray himself by sound, what with the waterfall out there pounding away. He shook his head. No, we trapped this side of the river, but not the other. We'd be too vulnerable on that side. And why bother? We really don't want to catch these things, do we? He didn't look as if he did, and she agreed with him. After all, what could they do with one if they did catch it, alive or dead? All that would do would be to tell them what the hunters looked like, and there were easier ways to do that. Not unless we have to start whittling down their numbers, she murmured, thinking that this cave was both a good and a bad place to be. They could defend it, but it would be hard for rescuers to spot, and it would be very easy to place them in a state of siege from which there was no escape. The narrowness of the chimney that made it impossible for anything to climb down also rendered it impossible for them to climb up. Right. Then tomorrow, if it looks clear, we go get some green wood and leaves from across the way to make a smoke signal with. We get all the dry driftwood we can and stock it in here. He cocked his head to one side, and waited for her contribution. Water we have, finally. I might just as well start fishing, and as long as we're running a smoke signal fire, it can do double duty, and I can smoke what we don't eat. That way, if we're trapped in here, we'll have something to eat. We ought to go back down the way we came in, and decide what kind of traps we can lay. 
At least one rock fall, right at the entrance, with a release one of us can trigger from in here, he said promptly and yawned. <sighs> what a lot of work and cleverness. We can even barricade the opening of the cave with wood and rocks. We're certainly clever enough, so all we need is the work. <sighs> and that is about all of the thinking that I'm good for. I've got to get some sleep. I don't need a blanket. There's plenty warm enough in here next to the fire. He winked at her. I can even lie down on this nice soft sand so that I'm between the fire and the entrance and screen it with my body. I shall sacrifice staying near the cold and water to do this duty. Big of you. Help me spread out the bedding so it can dry, she responded dryly. Then you can sleep all you like, at least until it's your turn on watch. And may there be nothing to watch for, except a search party and that soon, she thought, as he chuckled and moved to help her with the damp blankets. By now they'll have missed us back home. We didn't make the rendezvous, and the other patrol should have sent word back with their telesen. How long until we're missing instead of overdue? And will they look for us when they think we're only late? I wish I knew. I only know one thing. Father's going to go out of his mind when he hears of this. I'm glad I'm not the one to tell him. Amber Drake stared at Commander Judith. For a moment her words made no sense. Then suddenly, they made all too much sense. The what? All of Amber Drake's hard-won equanimity deserted him. He rose out of the chair in his office as if he'd sat on a hot coal. Indeed, that was very much the way he felt. Calm down, Drake. The youngsters are only overdue by a day, Judith told him. She looked outwardly calm, but he knew more than enough about her, and the tiny telltale signals her body showed to know, that she was seriously worried. And yet, that was simply not good enough. And the patrol they were relieving got to the rendezvous point expecting them to be there yesterday, and they weren't there. She's worried. She's only worried. And she still hasn't done anything. And they haven't shown up yet. He held both arms of his chair in a strangled grip, and stared at her with unveiled accusation in his eyes. So why aren't you doing anything? You know those two are as by the book as any trainees you've ever had. They have never, ever violated orders. If they had a reason to be late, if they knew they were going to be delayed, they'd have sent a Tellison message. If they haven't, it's because they can't, because something happened to them. His voice was rising and he knew it, and what was more, he didn't care that he was making a blatant display of his emotions. For once in his life, he wanted someone to know how upset he was. Judith made soothing motions, as if she thought he could somehow be propitiated by a few words, as if she thought he could be reasoned out of his hysteria. She was certainly going to try. We are doing something, Drake. The patrol has left the rendezvous, and they are going out to see if they can't find some sign of Blade and Tad. It's too early to get in a panic about this. Too early to get in a panic? Who does she think she's talking to? He held himself back from exploding at her, only by great effort of will. You tell me that, when it's your child that's missing, he snapped at her. Or have you gotten so wrapped up in being a commander that you've forgotten this isn't wartime? Instead of telling me not to panic, I suggest you tell me what else you're doing right now. And if you aren't doing anything right now, I am not interested in hearing why you can't. I'll pull in every resource I have to see that something does get done, and without any nonsense about not getting into a panic because one person thinks it's too early. That was the closest he had ever come in his life to saying that he was actually going to use all the power and influence he held and had never used before for any reason. And I will. I'll do it if I have to blackmail everyone in this city, even her. It was a threat a real one, and he was not bluffing. But he felt he owed it to Judith to warn her that lightning was going to fall on her before it came. If he used all his influence, it would be worse than lightning, and Judith's position of commander might not survive the storm. Her eyes darkened dangerously at his words, but her voice remained calm and even, which was something of a testament to her own control. Judith did not like threats, but she was a realist, and she must know that he was not bluffing. Right at this moment, the original patrol is flying out about a day in the right direction to see if they can find anything. If they don't, they'll go north of the track, then south, 
to see if they somehow went off course. Meanwhile, we're working on it. We're not just sitting around waiting to see what happens. We're trying to find some way of locating them from here. And, and, she finally raised her own voice as he got ready to explode again. And, we are putting together search parties. Those will leave in the morning, since we can't possibly get one together before then. There is no point in grabbing unprepared people and sending them out at random. Now, if you can think of anything I might have missed, I'd like to hear it. The truth was he couldn't, but that didn't stop him from wanting some action right that very moment, something besides merely readying a search party. I can't think of anything, but I'm... <laughs> this is difficult. It's hard to think, he admitted grudgingly. Does Scan know yet? Aubrey's telling him. Poor Aubrey, her turn said. But poor Scan was what he was thinking. He was afraid of this. He didn't want Tad to go off on this assignment any more than I wanted Blade to. I know he thought about going to Judith and asking them to be reassigned to something else, and didn't do it. And now he must be wondering if he is to blame for them being missing. I'll tell Winterheart, he began, his throat tightening at the thought. Gods, how do I tell her? This was my fault, if it all comes down to it. Something I said or did made Blade want to be in the Silvers in the first place. All my interference made her want to be assigned somewhere far away from here. If I hadn't tried to meddle in her life so much, she would still be here. Maybe even doing something else with her life. And Tad would have a different partner, one that wouldn't have urged him to ask for assignment out of the city. He desperately wanted someone else to take on the burden of telling her so that he did not have to face her accusing eyes. Cowardly, yes, but... No, I'll tell her, Judith said firmly. I already know where she is, and I'm Silverblade's commander. That's part of my job. You go to scan. I'll send her to you there. There, as everyone in White Griffin knew, was Kachara's nursery this time of the day. Scandranan spent at least an hour with her and the other children, human and otherwise, every afternoon. He loved to spend time with them, telling stories, playing games. Once again Amber Drake got to his feet and headed for the door. This time Judith didn't stop him. As soon as the White Griffin Council Hall was finished, the spouses of every city official had demanded the addition of real officers to it, Winterheart included. We're tired of you people bringing work home, and we're tired of having work follow you home, she had said, both in her capacity as Spoke's spouse and in her capacity as a city official herself. Home is where you go to get away from idiots who can't find the public latrine without a map and a guide. And every official gets an office, even if it's no bigger than a closet, she had added. I don't care if the post of Kelesia clan chief has never had a physical office before. The Kelesia clan chief has also never lived in anything other than a tent before. And if he can break tradition by living in a cave, he can break it a little more by having an office and regular hours. And he can bar the door when his office hours are over. She had glared at Amber Drake, and her eyes had said, And that goes twice as much for you, my dear, and over-obliging spouse. Since Lionwind's wife had been standing behind Winterheart, nodding her head at every word and with one hand on her knife, he and every other city official had readily agreed. The offices were all built into the cliff behind the council hall, small and private, and close to the other public buildings. The administrative building for the Silvers was not that far away from Amber Drake's office, and in that building was the nursery they had made for Kachara when she was still acting as the communication centre for the Silvers. She shared it with the youngsters of anyone else in the Silvers or in city administration who needed to have someone tend their little ones while they worked. It was a good arrangement for everyone, and it gave Kachara a never-ending stream of playmates who were all her mental age, even if she was chronologically six or more times elder. Even though Kachara's powers were severely limited, she could still talk to any griffin within the city territory. That alone was useful to the Silvers, and a very good reason to keep her right where she always had been. As Amber Drake hurried toward the building, every muscle and nerve writhing with anxiety, he couldn't even begin to imagine how Judith had thought that Aubrey could break something like this gently to scan. She must have been so upset by the news that her ability to reason had flown right out the door. Aubrey hasn't the tact of a brick, when Scan, Drake, 
The bellow of a griffin enraged could probably be heard all the way up to the farms, and the griffin that burst out the door of the silver's headquarters looked perfectly ready to chew up iron and spit out nails. Burst was indeed the correct term. The white and black griffin erupted from the door flying, his head swiveling in all directions, presumably looking for his friend as he gained altitude. Drake! Scan bellowed again, from a height of about three lengths above him. These idiots! They've lost— I know, I know, Amber Drake shouted back, waving his hands frantically. That's why I'm— Scan folded his wings and landed heavily, as if he were pouncing on something, every feather on end. I want every mage in this city working on a way to find them, he said wrathfully. I don't care what they're doing. This is an emergency. I want everybody pulled in off of what they're doing, and I want search parties out there now. I want messengers sent to Charlemagne. I want every man the Highly can spare out there looking too. I want— We have to work this together, or they're not going to listen to us. Amber Drake seized his friend's head in both hands, hooking his fingertips into the griffin's nares. He pulled Scan's beak down so that the griffin was looking directly into his eyes. I know, he said forcefully. Believe me, I feel the same. We have to call the council to authorize this scan, but I don't think anybody on it is going to disagree with us, and if they do, Scan growled wordlessly at the very idea, if they do, we, we both know things they wish we didn't, he pointed out. We do, and I'll use that. There it was. Scan agreed with him. It wasn't right, but it was better than arguing with shard counters until it was too late to do anything. But there's no point in scattering everybody like a covey of frightened quail, Drake persisted, trying to convince himself as much as Scandranan. All right, let's get things coordinated. Judith told the original patrol to look for them. Right now that's all that anyone can do out there. We have to organize and get people out there, talk people into using gates again if we have to. We have to get council backing for all that before anything else can be done. And that isn't going to happen if we're both standing here and wasting precious time screaming like outraged parents. We are outraged parents. The griffin kicked clods of dirt in flurries of rage. I don't want to have to follow procedure. Amber Drake put his fists on his hips and leaned towards Gandranen. We will get council approval by whatever means necessary. I hate it. But that's the case. If we want to have more than just the usual effort from the Silvers, we have to get council authorization, and that's where the threats of blackmail come in. Scan growled again, but without as much force behind it. Damn it, Drake. Why do you have to be so right? He snarled. All right, then. I'll go back in there and have Kachara call in the council members so we can authorize all of this. Amber Drake wanted to add, Don't frighten her but he held his tongue. Of all of them, Scan knew best how not to do anything that would make Kachara unhappy. He was her papa Scan, and she loved him with all of her heart, which was as large as her poor brain was small. He would no more do anything to frighten her than he would allow Blade and Tad to languish in the wilderness, unsought for and unrescued. He headed back toward the council hall, certain that if Winterheart and Janiel were not already on the way there, after Kachara's call, they would be. Scan came stalking in shortly after Drake, and within moments after that, the rest of the council members came hurrying in. Judith was one of the first, looking very surprised and taken aback, and just a little annoyed, and although Scan levelled an icy glare at her, his tone was civil enough. I've called this meeting, he said, since this is an emergency situation. He waited only until there were enough council members present to constitute a quorum, and until everyone was seated before nodding to Judith. You're the commander of the Silvers, so I think it best that you explain the emergency to the rest of the council, he said crisply. Judith looked as if she wanted to say something scathing to him, but held her tongue, which was probably wise. Amber Drake had a good idea of what she was thinking, however. She was first and foremost a military commander, and under any circumstances the fact that two of the most junior members of the Silvers were missing or overdue should not have been considered an emergency the council should be concerned with. Only an hysterical, but powerful, parent could have thought that it was, and Amber Drake would have cheerfully throttled her for suggesting any such thing if she dared. Throttled her, then revived her so I could throttle her again. 
Part of him was appalled at this capacity for violence within himself. The rest of him nodded in gleeful agreement at the idea. Then I'd revive her so that Scan could have a turn. But she evidently knew better, or the threat of his influence made her think twice about suggesting any such thing. Judith explained the situation coolly and calmly, while the other members of the council listened without making any comments. Scan kept glaring around the table as if daring any of them to say that this was not the sort of emergency for which the council should be called. No one did, but Snowstar did have something to say that put the entire situation into a perspective that Amber Drake greatly appreciated. Has anyone ever gone missing this way before? he asked, without looking either at Scan or at Amber Drake. I know that there have been a handful of accidents among the Silvers, but I don't ever recall any of our Silvers on outpost duty ever disappearing before. Judith, you haven't even had any fatalities in the Silvers since we encountered the Hylie, and all of those were on the trek to find the coast. If this is a new development, I think it is a very serious one. Aubrey opened his beak, then looked at Judith, startled. She was the one who replied. Actually... You're right, she said, sounding just as surprised as Aubrey looked. The fatalities among young griffins since we founded the city have all been among the hunters, not the silvers, and the accidents causing injuries among the silvers have all been just that. Accidents, usually caused by weather, and not a single death from something like a drunkard or fight. To date we haven't had a single case of outpost patrols going missing. They've broken limbs, they've gotten sick, we've had to send help to them and one set of humans even got lost once, but they had a Tellison and we knew they were all right. We just couldn't find them for a while. We've never had anyone just vanish before. Her eyes were the only part of her that showed how alarmed this new observation made her, but Amber Drake was savagely pleased at the way that her eyes went blank and steely. He knew that look. That was General Judith, suddenly encountering a deadly enemy, where she had been told there was open ground with no threats. I kept thinking this was sort of one of the hazards of duty, but that was under war conditions or while we were making our way here, Aubrey muttered, so shamefaced that his nares flushed a brilliant red. Snowstar, you're right. We've never lost a silver since since we allied with the Hylae. You two have been making the mistake of thinking that the silvers were the extension of the old army, but they aren't and our situation is completely different than it was before the wars. And how could I have been so blind not to have seen your blindness? Then I believe this does qualify as a full-scale emergency, Snowstar said firmly. When two highly trained individuals drop completely out of sight, for no reason and with no warning, it seems to me that the danger is not only to them alone, but possibly to the entire city. What if they were removed? so that they could not alert us to some enemy who was moving against us. How can we know that if we don't mount a rescue in strength and numbers? Heads nodded all around the table, and Amber Drake exchanged stricken glances with Winterheart, who had come in just in time to hear that. He felt cold all over, and she had paled. He could have done without hearing that. He was perversely glad that Snowstar had thought of it, for it certainly swayed even the veterans on the council to their cause, but he could have done without hearing it. Either Snowstar really believes that, or the self-proclaimed non-diplomat Snowstar just made a shrewd play in our support. Or both. A heavy and ominous silence filled the council hall, and no one seemed prepared to break it. Scam was as frozen as a statue, and beside him, Janille simply looked to be in too much shock to be able to think. Winterheart stood beside her council seat, unable to sit, clutching the back of it, her knuckles were as white as her namesake. Amber Drake himself felt unable to move, every limb leaden and inert. Judith cleared her throat, making all of them jump. Right, she said briskly, silence broken. We have the original pair flying a search pattern. We are putting together more search teams. Does anyone have any further suggestions? Scan opened his beak, but Snowstar beat him to it. I'll organize the mages and start distance scrying, he said immediately. We're probably too far away, but those who can scry for them should at least try. We'll look for the traces of the magic on all the items they had with them. Even if something made them crash, those traces will still be there. I'll also pick out mages for the search parties. 
Once again, Scan opened his beak, then glared around the table, to make certain that he wasn't interrupted this time. We should send a message to Charlemagne, he said belligerently. His people know the forest better than we do. We should make him, I mean, ask him, to send our parties of his hunters. That's good, Judith approved, making a note of it. I can put anyone who's been posted to that area on search parties, but if we can find highly who are trained to hunt the forest in addition to our own people, that will be even better. Anything else? Search parties? Magic? The highly? Thoughts flitted through Drake's head, but he couldn't make any of them hold still long enough to be examined. Judith looked around the table to meet shaking heads and nodded. Good, we've got a plan, she said firmly. We should assume that whatever has happened to these silvers could endanger the city, and make finding them a top priority. Let's get to it. She stood up and was halfway to the door before anyone else was even out of his chair. He didn't blame her. If the situation was reversed, he wouldn't want to be in the same room with four frantic parents either. And he wouldn't want to face two people who had just threatened to blackmail him for not taking the loss of their children seriously enough. Everyone else deserted the hall as quickly. Only Aubrey paused at the door, looking back with uncertainty in his gaze. He opened his beak, then swallowed hard, shook his head, and followed the others. Scandranum wanted nothing more than to rush off to the rescue of his son. Failing that, he wanted to tear the gizzard out of those who were responsible for his disappearance. Right now, so far as his heart was concerned, the ones responsible were right here in White Griffin. Judith and Aubrey. It was all their fault. If they hadn't assigned the children to this far-flung outpost, both his beloved son and his dear friend Amber Drake's daughter would still be here. I knew that this was a mistake all along, he seethed at Janiel as he paced the length and breadth of the council hall. I knew they were too young to be sent off on our post duty. No one that young has ever been sent off alone like that before. They should have been posted here like everyone else was. Judith's getting senile, and Aubrey was already there to show her the way, and... Please! Janiel suddenly exploded. Stop! He stared at her, his mouth still open, one foot raised. Stop it, Scan, she said in a more normal tone. It's not their fault. It's not the fault of anyone. And if you would stop trying to find someone to blame, we would get something done. She looked up at him with fear and anxiety in her eyes. You were a mage. I'm not. You go to work with Snowstar and the others. I shall go to the messenger mage and send a message in your name to Charlemagne, asking for his help. At least I can do that much. And Scandranan. He is my son as well as yours, and I am able to act without rages and threats. With that she turned away from him, and left him still standing with his foot upraised and his beak open, staring after her in shock. Alone, for Amber Drake and Winterheart had already left. Stupid, stupid Griffin. She's right, you know. Blaming Aubrey and Judith won't get you anywhere, and if you take things out on them, you're only going to make them mad at you. The black Griffin will be remembered as an angry, overprotective, vengeful parent. And what good would that do? None, of course. What good would it do? All at once his energy ran out of him. He sat down on the floor of the council hall feeling old. Old, tired, defeated, and utterly helpless, shaking with fear and in the grip of his own weakness. He squinted his eyes tightly closed, ground his beak and shivered from anything but cold. Somewhere out there, his son was lost, possibly hurt, certainly in trouble and there was nothing, nothing that he could do about it. This was one predicament that the Black Griffin wasn't going to be able to swoop in and salvage. I couldn't swoop in on anything these days, even if I could salvage it. I'm an anachronism. I've outlived my usefulness. It is happening all over again, except this time there can't be a rebirth of the Black Griffin from the White Griffin. The body wears out, the hips grow stiff and the muscles strain. I'm the one that's useless and senile, not Judith and Aubrey. They were doing the best they could. I was the one flapping my beak and making stupid threats. That is all that is left for a failed warrior to do. For a moment he shook with the need to throw back his head and keen his grief and helplessness to the sky, in the faint hope that perhaps some god somewhere might hear him. His throat constricted terribly. With the weight of intolerable grief and pain on his shoulders, 
he slowly raised his head. As his eyes fell on the door through which Janiel had departed, his mind unfroze, gradually coming out of its shock. What am I? What am I thinking? I may be old now, but I'm still a legend to these people. Heroes don't ever live as long as they want to, and most die young. I've lasted. That's all experience. I'm a mage, and more skilled than I was when I was younger. And I'm not the fighter I used to be. I'm also a lot smarter than I used to be. And what I'm feeling... I know what it is. I know. It was what Ertho felt every time I left, every time one of his griffins wound up missing. I loved him so dearly, and I breathe each breath honouring his memory. But he was a great man because he accepted his entire being and dealt with it. I'm not Ertho, but I'm his son in spirit, and what I honour I can also emulate. There's plenty I can do, starting with seeing to it that Snowstar hasn't overlooked anything. He shook himself all over, as if he was shaking off some dark, cold shadow that was unpleasantly clinging to his back, and strode out of the council hall as fast as his legs would carry him. What I honour in Ertho's deeds, others have also honoured in me. Ertho could embrace every facet of a situation, and handle all of them with all of his intellect, whether it angered him personally or not. That was why he was a leader, and not a panicked target. He could act when others would be overwhelmed by emotion. If I think of this disappearance in terms only of how I feel about it, then I will miss details that could be critical while I fill my vision with myself, and that could cost lives. Let the historians argue over whether I was enraged or determined or panicked on this day. I can still be effective to my last breath. It was not clear at first where the adept had run off to, and by the time Scan tracked him down, Snowstar had managed to gather all of the most powerful mages together in his own dwelling and workshop. Scan was impressed in spite of himself at how quickly the Caladine mage had moved. It was notoriously difficult to organise mages, but Snowstar seemed to have accomplished the task in a very limited amount of time. There were seven mages at work, including Snowstar. They had been divided into pairs, seated at individual tables, so that they didn't interfere with each other, each pair of them scrying for something in particular. One pair looked for the Telesen, one for the tent, one for the basket. Snowstar was working by himself, but the moment that Scan came near him he looked up and beckoned. I'm looking for Tadrith myself, he said without preamble. I was waiting for you to help me. The blood tie he has with you is going to make it possible to find him, if it's at all possible. You will both feel similar magically, as you know. If, Scan said, growing cold all over. Is he saying that he thinks Tad is... dead? You mean you feel he's already dead? Snowstar made a soothing gesture. No, actually, I don't. Even if Tadrith was unconscious or worse, we'd still find him under normal circumstances. And the problem is that I'm fairly certain that they're quite out of our range. The white-haired Caladine adept shook his head. But fairly isn't completely, and under the impetus of powerful emotions, people have been known to do extraordinary things before this. As you should know, better than any of us, I'm more than willing to try, if you are. Scan grunted in extreme irritation, but reined it in. Stupid question, Snowstar. I'd try until I fell over. Snowstar grimaced. I know it was a stupid question. Forgive me. Fortunately, that won't matter to the spell or the stone. He gestured at a small table and the half-dome of volcanic glass atop it. Would you? Scan took his place opposite the chair behind the table. He'd done scrying himself before, once or twice, but always with another mage and never with Snowstar. Each mage had his own chosen vehicle for scrying, but most used either a clear or black stone or a mirror. He put his four claws up on the table, surrounding his half of the stone with them. Snowstar placed his own hands on the table, touching fingertip to talon tip with Scan. After that, it was a matter of Scan concentrating on his son, and supplying mage energy to Snowstar, while Snowstar created and loosed the actual spell. Some mages had a visual component to this work, but Snowstar didn't. It took someone who was not only able to see mage energy, but one who was sensitive to its movement, like a griffin, to sense what he was doing. Scan felt the energy gathering all around them, and condensing into the form of the spell, like a warm wind encircling them and then cooling. 
He felt it strain and target the restraints Snowstar held in it, and he felt Snowstar finally let go. Then, nothing. It leaped out and dissipated. It wasn't gone, as if it had gone off to look for something. It was gone, as if it had stretched itself out so thin that a mere breeze had made it fragment into a million uncoordinated bits. Snowstar jerked as if a string holding him upright had snapped, then sagged down, his hands clutching the stone. Damn, he swore softly, as harsh an oath as Scan had ever heard him give voice to. It's no good. It's just too far. Scan sagged himself, his throat locked up in grief, his chest so tight that it was hard to take a breath. Tad. A few moments later, the others had all uttered the same words, in the same tones of anger and defeat, all except the pair trying to reach the Tellison. They simply looked baffled and defeated, and they hadn't said anything. Finally, Snowstar stopped waiting for them to speak up for themselves and went over to them. Well, he said, as Scan followed on his heels. Scan knew both of them. One was a young Kaladine called Red Oak, the other a mercenary mage from Earthos following named Gilles. The latter was an uncannily lucky fellow. He had been a mere journeyman at the beginning of the mage storms following the cataclysm, but when they were over, he was an adept. He was more than a bit bewildered by the transition, but had handled it gracefully, far more gracefully than some would have. I can't explain it, sir, he said, obviously working to suppress an automatic reaction to authority of snapping to attention and saluting. When I couldn't reach Tadrith's device, I tried others, just to make certain that there wasn't something wrong with me. I've been able to call up every Tellison we've ever created, including the one out there with the patrol looking for the missing silvers. I got the one we left with the garrison at Kimbata, which is farther away than Tadrith is. I got all of them, except the one we sent out with Tadrith and Silverblade. It's... He shook his head. It's just gone. As if it was never there before. It hasn't even been retuned or broken. That would leave a telltale. I've been working with Tellisons most of my life as a mage, and I've only seen something like this happen once before. Was that during the wars? Snowstar asked instantly. Gilles nodded. Yes, sir, and it was just a freak accident. Something you'd have to have been an adept to pull off, though. Some senile old fart who should never have been put in charge of anything was given an unfamiliar Tellison to recharge and reversed the whole spell. Basically, he sucked all the magic out of it, made it just so much unmagical junk. Gilles shrugged. The only reason he could do that was because he was an adept. Senile, but still an adept. We make those Tellisons foolproof for a good reason. Tadrith couldn't have done that, even by accident and a thousand tries a day, and even if someone actually smashed the Tellison, I'd still be able to activate it and get a damaged echo back. If it had been shattered by spell, the telltale would still mark the area magically. I don't know what to think about this. Snowstar pursed his lips, his forehead creasing as he frowned. Neither do I. This is very peculiar. Scan looked from one mage to the other and back again. He caught Red Oak's eye. The Kaladine just held up his hands in a gesture of puzzlement. The signature of an adept is fairly obvious, Red Oak said slowly. All adepts have a distinctive style to even a moderately trained eye. Earthos was his ability to make enchantments undetectable. His mark was that there was no mark, but as far as I know he could only veil spells he himself had crafted. The Highly would have seen something like this situation I wager by now. An adept usually doesn't refrain from doing magic any time he can, especially not one of the old neutrals. They were positively flamboyant about it, and that was one of the quarrels that Artho had with them. I have an idea, Snowstar finally said. Listen, all of you, I'll need all your help on this. We're going to do something very primitive, much more primitive than scrying. He looked around the room. Red Oak, you and Gilles and Joffa put all the small work tables together. Rides alone. You know where my shaman implements are. Go get them. Laura, Greenwing, come with me. He looked at Scan. You, go to the Silver's headquarters and get me the biggest map of the area the children were headed into that you can find or bully out of them. They might give me an argument. You, they won't dare. They'd lose a limb, Scan growled, and he went straight for the door. He did his best not to stagger. He hadn't used that much mage energy in a long time, and it took more out of him than he had expected. All right, Griffin. Remember what you told yourself earlier? You have experience. 
It may fall on your beak from fatigue and tear something trying to fly in and save the day, but you have experience. Rely on experience when your resources are low, and rely on others when you can, not when you want to, vain griffin. Work smarter, think, use what you have, and don't break yourself, stupid griffin, because you're running out of spare parts. He saw to his surprise that it was already dark outside. He hadn't realised that he had spent so long with the mages, trying to find the children. No wonder he was tired and a bit weak. The Silver's headquarters was lit up as if they were holding high festival inside, which made him feel a bit more placated. At least they were doing something, taking this seriously now. Too bad Snowstar had to convince them there was a threat to their own hides before they were willing to move. They should have just moved on it. Wasn't that the way we operated in the old days? He barged in the front door, ready to foreclaw and grabbed the first person wearing a silver griffin badge that he saw, explaining what he wanted in a tone that implied he would macerate anyone who denied it to him. The young human did not even make a token protest as the talons caught in his tunic, and the huge beak came dangerously near his face. "'Stay here, s sir!' he stammered, backing up as soon as Scan let go of him. "'I'll f find what you want and b bring it r right here!' Somehow, tonight, Scan had the feeling that he was not beloved where'er he went. That was fine. In his current black mood, he would much rather be feared than beloved. People have been thinking of me as the jolly old fraud, the uncle who gives all the children pony rides, he thought, grating his beak, his talons scoring the floor as he seethed. They forgot what I was, forgot the warrior who used to tear Makar apart with his bare talons. Well, tonight... They were getting a reminder. The boy came back very quickly with the rolled-up map. Scan unrolled it, just long enough to make certain that they weren't trying to fob something useless off on him to make him go away, then gruffly thanked the boy and launched himself out the door. Despite the darkness, he flew back with his prize. When he marched through Snowstar's door, he saw at once that the workroom had already been transformed. Everything not needed for the task at hand had been cleared away against the wall. Other projects had been piled atop one another, with no thought for coherence. It was going to take days to put the workroom back into some semblance of order, but Scan doubted that Snowstar was going to be thinking about anything but Blade and Tad until they were found. At least we have one friend who took all this seriously without having to be persuaded. The several small tables were now one large one, waiting for the map he held in his beak. The moment he showed his face at the door, eager hands took, snatched, the map away from him, and spread it out on the table. Red oak lit a pungent incense, filling the room with smoke that just stopped short of being eye-watering. The mage that Snowstar had called Rides Alone, who came from one of the many odd tribes that Ertho had won to his cause, had a drum in his hands. Evidently he was going to be playing it during whatever it was they were going to do. Right. Snowstar stood over the table the only one who was standing, and held a long chain, terminating in a teardrop-shaped, rough-polished piece of some dark stone. Red Oak, you watch what the pendulum does, and mark what I told you on the map. Rides alone. Give me a heartbeat rhythm. The rest of you, concentrate. I'll need your combined energies along with anything else I can pull up out of the local node. Scan that goes for you, too. Come sit opposite me, but don't think of Tad or Blade. Think of me. Got that? He was not about to argue. This looked rather like one of those bizarre shamanistic rituals that Ertho used to try now and again when classical spellcasting failed. He simply did as he was told, watching as Snowstar carefully suspended the pendulum over the map at the location where the youngsters had last been heard from. Rides alone began a steady drum pattern, hypnotic without inducing slumber. Somehow it enhanced concentration. How that was managed... Scan could not begin to imagine. For a long time, nothing happened. The stone remained quite steady, and Scan was afraid that whatever Snowstar had planned wasn't working after all. But Snowstar remained impassive, and little by little, he began to move the pendulum along a route going north and east of the point of the youngster's last camp. And abruptly, without any warning at all, the pendulum did move. It swung, violently and abruptly away from the spot Snowstar had been trying to move it toward, and in total defiance of gravity, it hung at an angle, as if it were being repelled by something there. Snowstar gave a grunt, although Scan could not tell if it was satisfaction or not, and Red Oak made a mark on the map with a stick of charcoal. 
Snowstar moved his hand a trifle. The pendulum came back down, as if it had never exhibited its bizarre behavior. Snowstar moved it again, a little at a time, and once again came to a point where the pendulum repeated its action. The strange scene was repeated over and over, as Red Oak kept marking places on the map and Snowstar moved the pendulum back. It took uncounted drumbeats, and sweat was pouring down the faces of every mage around the table, when Snowstar finally dropped the pendulum and signaled to Rides alone to stop drumming. There was an irregular area marked out in charcoal, dots on the map, an area that the pendulum avoided, and which the youngster's flight would have bisected. Red Oak connected the dots outlining a weirdly shaped blotch. I would lay odds that they are in there somewhere, Snowstar said wearily. It's an area in which there is no magic, no magic and no magical energy. Whatever is given off in the normal course of things by animals and plants is immediately lost somehow, and I suspect magic brought into that area is drained away as well. I can only guess that is what happened to their basket when they flew over it. So the basket became heavier, and they couldn't fly with it? Red Oak hazarded, and whistled when Snowstar nodded. That's not good. But how did you know what to use to find all this? Snowstar shrugged modestly. It was Gilles that gave me the idea to look for a negative, and I remembered shamanic dowsing. You can look for something that is there, like metal or something that is not there, like water. Ertho taught it to me. We used to use it to make certain that we weren't planting our outpost atop unstable ground. He looked across the table at Scan, who was trying very hard to tell himself that it wasn't likely for all the magic infused in the basket to drain off at once. He did not want to think about what that would have meant for poor Tadrath if the basket regained its normal weight in a single moment while aflight. Take that map with you, and tell Judith what we've found, the adept told Scan. I'll work with the mages I'm sending out with the search teams. There's probably something about the area itself that we can shield against. I doubt that a mage caused this. It might just be a freak of nature, and the Hylia would never have seen it, because they were looking for magic, not its absence. Scan nodded, and Red Oak brushed a quick drying varnish on the map to set the charcoal. The fumes warred unpleasantly with the lingering scent of the incense, but the moment the map was dry, the younger mage rolled it up and handed it to the black griffin. Scan did not want to wait around to see what the rest of the mages were going to do. He took the map and fled out the door for the second time that evening. This time he went straight to the planning room, which Judith still referred to as the war room, out of habit and it looked very much as if they were planning for a wartime situation. Judith had a map spread out over the table. There were aides darting everywhere. Aubrey was up on his hindquarters tracing out a line with one talon when Scan came in through the door. Snowstar thinks he has a general area, Scan said, as silence descended and all heads but Judith swiveled around at his entrance. That's what he wanted the map for, here. He handed the map to the nearest aide, who spread it out on the table over the existing one at Judith's nod. What's that? she asked, pointing at the blobby outline on the map. It's an area where there isn't magic, Scan replied. He repeated what Snowstar had told him, without the details of shamanic dousing. That would be why we can't raise the Teleson. Snowstar thinks that anything that's magical gets all the mage energy sucked out of it when it enters that area. And if the spell making the basket into something Tad could tow lost its power... Judith sucked in her lower lip, as one of the aides coughed. Well, no matter how they landed, they're stuck now. No Tellison, no magic. They'd have to hole up and hope for rescue. Aubrey studied the map for a moment. The only teams we've sent out there were griffin pairs, with one exception, he pointed out. You and me, Judith. We used a basket and our fly path took us over that area. Nothing happened to us. So where did this come from? Maybe it's been growing, offered one of the aides. Maybe the more it eats, the bigger it grows. Well, that's certainly cheerful, Judith said dryly, and patted the girl on the shoulder when she flushed a painful red. No, you have a point, and we're going to have to find out what's causing this if you're right. If it's growing, sooner or later it's going to reach us. I did without working magic long enough, and I'm not in the mood to do it again. That's a lot of area to cover, Aubrey pointed out. They could be anywhere in there, depending on how far they got before they had to land. Land? Or crash? Scan's imagination was all too clever at providing him with an image of the basket plummeting down out of the sky. We can probably cover it with four teams including a base camp, Judith said at last, but I think we're going to have to do a ground search in a sweep pattern. 
Those trees are bigger than anything most of us here have ever seen before, and you could drop Ertho's tower in there and not see most of it. Griffins may not do us a lot of good. They can look for signal smoke, Aubrey objected. Judith did not say anything, but Scan knew what she was thinking, since it was something that he was already trying not to think about. The youngsters might be too badly hurt to put up a signal fire. Right, then the two already in the area can look for signal smoke, she said. I'll fly in a mage here to set up a match gate terminus, and I'll call for volunteers for four teams who are willing to trust their hides to a gate. I shall go, said a deep voice from the doorway. Scan swiveled his head as Ikala moved silently into the room. With all respect, Commander, I must go. I know this forest. Your people do not. Forget my rank and my breeding. My father would say that you should in a case like this. These two are my friends and my sworn comrades, and it is my honour and duty to help them. You are more than welcome, then. I'm going. You can count on it, Scan said instantly. Drake will probably want to go too, Judith. That'll give you one mage and a field healer along with a fighter. Judith sighed but made no objections, probably because she knew they would be futile. All right, but these are going to be big teams. I don't want tiny little patrols running around in unknown territory. I want two mages, so you have one for each night watch on each team, and I want at least as many fighters. Ikala, you go call for volunteers among the hunters and the silvers. Scan, go back to Snowstar and explain the situation and what we need. She glared at both of them. Don't just stand there. Go! Scan went, but he was a fraction slower than Ikala and reached the door in second place. By the time he was outside, Ikala was nowhere in sight. But he was overjoyed that Ikala was still willing to volunteer, even with the need to trust to a gate for transport. The young Hylie was precisely what they needed, someone who knew the ordinary hazards of such a forest and how to meet them. Snowstar had already anticipated Judith's decision about a gate. As if any of us would be afraid to trust our own gates, he replied scornfully. We've been perfectly willing to use them for the last five years. It's been the rest of you who were so overly cautious about them. Not me, Scam protested, but Snowstar was already on to other things. Gilles will fly out with a griffin as soon as it's light. I'll have Red Oak head one of the other three teams after you all get through the gate, the adept was saying. I have more mages willing to volunteer than Judith needs, but not all of them are suited to this kind of mission. Tell her I'll be choosing combat experience over sheer power. We can't take the chance that this dead zone is a freak of nature. No matter what she thinks, it might have a traceable cause, and that cause might be one of the mages who escaped the wars. Scan nodded. He was certain that Judith had already thought of that. I'll go find Drake, he said. It was going to be a long night, and one he was certain none of them would be able to sleep through. They might as well start getting ready for deployment. At least that was something useful. Aging and hedonistic you may be, stupid griffin, but you're also effective. 8. Amber Drake did not sleep that night. Despite the feeling that he was working at a fever pitch, he got precious little accomplished. Most of what he did was to go over the same scenarios in his mind on paper, in fevered conversation with whoever would listen usually the long-suffering Geston. But no matter how tired he became, the weariness was never enough to overcome him, not even for a moment. Insomnia was only one of the physical effects he suffered. He simply could not be still. He would sit or lie down, only to leap to his feet again as another urgent thought struck him. The muscles of his neck and back were so tense that no amount of soaking would relax him. Not that he stayed long enough in a hot pool to do any good. He had not eaten since the news, his throat was too tight to swallow, his stomach a tight, cold knot, and as for his nerves, if he'd had a client as wrought up as he was, he would have recommended immediate tranquilization by a healer. But if he had submitted himself to a healer, he would be in no condition to accomplish anything thereafter. He could not do that. Amber Drake recalled Janiel's words of so long ago, as if they were an annoyance. Who heals the healer? Scan and Snowstar had not commandeered all of the mages in the city. There was always one whose sole duty was to oversee magical communications. Those communications were between both White Griffin and the Silvers posted outside the city, in Charlemagne's bodyguard, for instance, and with Charlemagne himself via his priests. There could be no speaking with Charlemagne directly, of course. There was no such thing in Hylie society as a direct link to anyone important. 
The messages would have to go through the priests, who were the only people permitted the use of magic, then to Charlemagne's chief priest Loyette, and only then to Charlemagne. Amber Drake tracked down the mage in question, and had him send his own personal plea for help to the Hylie in addition to scans, but after that, he was at loose ends. There was only so much he could do. He was no mage, he could not possibly help scan in trying to locate the children. He could pack, and did, for a trek across rough, primitive country, but that did not exactly take much time, even with Gaston coming along behind him and repacking it more efficiently. He certainly couldn't do anything to help the rescue parties of Silvers that Judith and Aubrey were organising. Even if he could have, it might only have made things worse. He suspected that after his threats, overt and covert, Judith would not appreciate seeing his face just now. Aubrey would be more forgiving, but Judith had lived long under the comfortable delusion that she no longer had to cope with the vagaries of politics. As with most true military leaders, she had always hated politics, even when she used political games to further her own causes. She had thought that without a king, a court, or a single titular leader among them, she was at last free to do what she wanted with the policing branch. She tried to keep the Silvers autonomous from the governing branch, and that was largely what she had accomplished. Now Amber Drake had made it very clear to her that there was no such thing as an environment that was free of politics, that under duress, even friends would muster any and all weapons at their disposal, and she had just learned in the harshest possible way that no one is ever free of the politics and machinations that arise when people live together as a group. No one likes to have their illusions shattered, least of all someone who holds so few. Judith would be very difficult to live with for some time. He only hoped that her good sense would overcome her anger with him, and that she would see and understand his point of view. Hopefully Judith would see Amber Drake as having used a long-withheld weapon at a strategic time, rather than seeing him as a friend who betrayed an unspoken trust to get what he wanted. If not, he had made an enemy, and there was nothing he could do about that now. Nor if he'd had the chance to reverse time and go back to that moment of threat, would he have unsaid a single word. He had meant every bit of it, and Judith had better get used to the idea that people, even the senior Kestra Chern, would do anything to protect their children. That was one thing she had never had to deal with as a military commander before because a military structure allowed replacement or reassignment of possible mutineers. Parental protectiveness was a factor that was going to be increasingly important, as the children of the original settlers of White Griffin entered the Silvers. Perhaps it was for the best that the precedent had been set in this way. And no matter what happens, knowing myself, I will have simultaneous feelings of justification as a concerned and desperate parent, as well as guilt, over not having done better and had more forethought. So there was nothing more he could do, really, except to wait. Wait for morning. Wait for word from Charlemagne and from the mages. Wait, wait, wait. Just as it was when he had served in Ertho's ranks, waiting was the hardest job he had ever held. He had been in control of at least part of the life of this city for so long that, like Judith, he had gotten accustomed to being able to fix problems as soon as they arose without anyone offering opposing force. Now as the number of emergencies died down and new people came into authority, his control was gone. All of his old positions of influence were in the hands of others, and he was back to the old game of waiting. Finally he returned home, since it was the first place where anyone with news would look for him. As he paced the walkway outside the house, unable to enter the place that now seemed too confining, and held far too many memories of his lost daughter, his mind circled endlessly without ever coming up with anything new. Only the circling, anger and fear, fear and anger. Anger at himself, at Judith, at Blade. It wasn't productive, but it was inevitable, and anger kept his imagination at bay. It was all too easy to imagine Blade hurt, Blade helpless, Blade menaced by predatory animals or more nebulous enemies, and once again, he would be one of the last to know what others had long since uncovered. He was only Blade's father, as he had only been a Kestra Chern yet hanging about in the hope that someone would take pity on him and tell him something was an exercise in futility. So he alternately paced and sat, staring out into the darkness, listening to the roar of the waves beneath him, in the light falling gently down onto the harbour from the city, the foam on the top of the waves glowed as if it was faintly luminescent. A wooden wind chime swung in the evening breeze to his right, and a glass one sang softly to his left. How often had he sat there on a summer evening, listening to those chimes? Caught between glass and wood, that which breaks and that which bends, that which sings and that which survives. So our lives go. 
Winterheart joined him long after the moon had come out. He turned at her familiar footstep to see her approaching from the direction of the council hall, the moonlight silvering her hair. In the soft light, there was no sign of her true age. She could have been the Trondi urn of Ertho's forces, or the first ambassador to the Hylae so many years ago. Only when she drew close were the signs of anxiety and tension apparent in her face, her eyes, the set of her mouth. They're putting together the last of the supplies, she said before he could ask. Scan and the mages haven't come out of Snowstar's work area yet, and Charlemagne hasn't replied. Don't worry, he will before the night is over. Remember how long his court runs at night? He did remember. In the tropical heat of the climate around Kimbata, Charlemagne's people all took long naps in the afternoon, and then continued their court ceremonies, entertainments and duties, until well after midnight. And he had no fear that Charlemagne would refuse help. The emperor could send off a hundred hunters or more from his forces, and they would never be missed. No, the only question was how soon the hunters could be somewhere that they could do some good. First the priests would have to approve the departure, then they would have to travel across many leagues of forest before they were anywhere near the place where the children had vanished. All that would take time. Precious time. Blindly he held out his arms and Winterheart came into them. They held each other, seeking comfort in one another's warmth and presence. There was no point in talking. They would only echo one another, each saying what the other was thinking. They both knew that, and knew that talking would ease nothing, soothe nothing. So they simply sat down on the smooth, cool stone bench outside their home, and held each other, and waited beneath the stars. Neither of them were strangers to waiting. That did not make waiting any easier, except that it removed the additional pain of loneliness. Judith must have gotten over her own anger by dawn, for she showed no signs of it when a messenger summoned both Amber Drake and Winterheart to what the young Silver called a planning session. The two of them had bathed and changed clothing, hoping that clean bodies would restore their minds a little. Amber Drake had shunned his usual finery in favour of something very like Winterheart's practical working garb, hoping that there might possibly be something he could do once the sun rose. When the summons came, both of them had been sitting over a breakfast neither of them had been able to touch, and it was a relief to rise and follow the youngster back to the council hall. Scan and Janil, and their other son Keenath, were already there, showing just as much strain as Amber Drake felt, although only someone who knew Griffins well would have recognised the signs of strain in overpreened feathers, plumage lying flat against the body, posture that showed their muscles were as tense and knotted as Amber Drake's. He doubted that they had slept, but the sight of Keenath made a moment of intense anger flash through Amber Drake's heart. He still has a child, and if his other had not been so intent on leaving the city, mine might not have gone either. But that was irrational and entirely incorrect, and he knew it. He suppressed it immediately, and he and Winterheart manoeuvred through the group crowded in here, so that they could form a united block with the other set of parents. Judith did not look as if she had slept either. Deep shadows touched the swollen pouches under her eyes, and she looked twice her real age. Aubrey didn't even pretend to be calm. He chewed incessantly on one of his old shed feathers, presumably to keep from shredding his current plumage. There were thirty or forty people in the group. Amber Drake noticed that at least six of them were mages, and he, Winterheart, Scan, Keenath, and Janiel, were the only non-silvers. Ikala was among the silvers gathered here, and Amber Drake was irrationally pleased to see him, as if the tall young man represented more than just a local expert on the rainforest. The council hall was the only room large enough to hold all of them, and Judith had completely taken it over, strewing maps and other documents all over the table. It looked as if she had been here for some time. Snowstar and the mages have uncovered something damned peculiar, she said, when they had all gathered around the map-covered table. She tapped a darkened, irregularly shaped blob on the map in front of her. This area here, has no signs of magic. None. And they tell me that's practically impossible. The missing patrol was due to pass along this line. She drew a swift mark with a piece of charcoal, which crossed the southern end of the irregular-shaped area. And if there's something in there that's negating mage energy, you can imagine for yourself what that would mean for both their carry basket and their telesom. Amber Drake was all too able to imagine what that would do to a carry basket, and from the way Winterheart had suddenly clutched his arm, her fingers digging into the muscle. So was she. In his mind, he saw the two figures he had watched fly off into the distance, suddenly stricken for a moment, then plummeting to their deaths on the unforgiving ground below. That means we're going to have to come in somewhere near the edge, 
and walk in, Judith continued, without any hint that she had envisioned the same disaster that had played itself out behind Amber Drake's eyes. Our gate probably won't work inside this area, and we'll have to suppose for now that nothing else magical in nature will work either. We'll have to operate by the old rules of working without magic, although yes, we will be taking mages, just in case magic does work after all. Though, if there's no local mage power available, Snowstar tells me that the mages will be just like journeymen and apprentices, and limited to their own personal power. That's going to put a serious crimp in their activities, and any mages that go along had better start thinking in terms of budgeting themselves before they act. She leveled a sharp glance across the table, to the point where the mages of the silvers had bunched together. What about the griffins? Someone wanted to know. Can't they just fly overhead and scout the way they always do? She closed her eyes for a moment and sighed. If I wanted a sign that our luck has turned truly wretched, I could not have conjured up one more certain. This is the rainy season for that part of the world, and the weather majors tell me that storms will be unceasing over this particular area for the next several days to a week. Thunderstorms have already grounded the original pair that was out looking for our missing silvers. They are on the ground and we know where they are. It might well be a side effect of the loss of magic over the area. We just don't know for certain. But what that means is that there won't be any flying going on. I'm not going to ban any griffins from the search parties, but they'll be strictly on foot unless the weather improves drastically. I'm still going, and so is Janiel and Keith, Scan spoke up firmly. Judith nodded, as if she had expected as much. In that case, since I'm going to divide the searchers into three parties, each griffin can go with one. I've already sent out a griffin with a gate mage, but he'll be coming straight back, and so will the two still out there while weather cooperates. Judith cocked an eyebrowed scan, as if she expected him to object to this, but he didn't. Amber Drake could certainly understand why. A griffin on the ground was severely handicapped. Scan, Janiel, and Keith would be as much a hindrance as they were a help. The two who had been on patrol would be exhausted, and the one who had ferried the gate mage even more so. Judith continued. Now, here's the current plan. We'll gate in here. That's the closest I want to get to this area with anything that depends upon magic. She stabbed down with her index finger. Here, the point where her finger indicated, was on the line that Blade and Tad had been expected to fly. The gate mage and a small party will stay here, at a base camp, holding the area for the rest of you. We'll divide up. The party with Scan and Drake in it will go north, up to the top of the area and then in. The one with the Carla leading it, including Keenath, will go straight in. The one with Winterheart and Janiel will go south, then in. That way we'll cover the maximum area in the shortest possible time. Judith straightened, and looked straight at Scan again. And in case you're wondering why I haven't put you two in on the expected line, it's because the two griffins out there already flew that line and didn't see anything before weather forced them down. So, either the missing patrol didn't fly that line, or it's going to take an expert in that kind of territory to find signs of them. That's Ikala, not you. He'll be leading a party of people all used to moving quickly, and after he scouts the line on the ground, he'll be covering the areas north and south of that line. I'm putting you two on the likeliest alternate track. Tad always had a tendency in training to stay on the northern side of a given flight line. My guess is, if they're anywhere off the line, it's in the north. But that's just a guess, Scan stated. They could be south. She nodded. And the gods know I've guessed wrong before. That's why the third party. The parties are going to number eight. One griffin, one healer, or Tron Diane, or whatever comes close. That's you, Drake. Two mages and five fighters, all experienced silvers. Any smaller is dangerous, any larger is unwieldy. Don't bother to pack at all. You'll be taking standard silver kits, including medical supplies, and you aren't going to have time to change clothing. Besides, by the time you make a camp at night, you and your clothing should be sluiced clean. Our stare at Amber Drake said as clearly as words, And if you don't like that, you don't have to go. He stared right back at her. Try and keep me from going and you'll have a fight. She waited for him to say something, staring into his gaze with challenge in her stance, but it was she who finally dropped her eyes. This is an in-and-out mission. The faster, the better. As of this moment, consider yourself facing a real enemy a powerful one, if he can drain all the mage energy out of a place. I don't know what's caused magic to leech out of that area, but I have to assume it's a hostile, and it isn't going to like having twenty-four people traipsing all over its territory. 
As soon as the mage gets to the gate point, we'll be bringing it up, and I don't want it up for longer than it takes to pitch all of you through it. Is that understood? Once again she stared at him, as if her words were meant for him alone. Her tone of voice implied that, given the opportunity, she would pitch Amber Drake through the gate. He simply nodded, as did everyone else. Good. From now until you leave, you're all sleeping, eating, and everything else right here. She smiled thinly at their surprise. That'll be quicker than trying to gather all of you up once the mage gets into place. I don't intend to waste a single minute on any dallying. I'll have sleeping arrangements brought in. The mage I sent out is being carried by Darzi, so I expect to hear that they've made their landing within the next full day. Amber Drake was impressed, as much by the identity of the griffin as by the speed with which the duo expected to reach their destination. He wondered what Judith had promised to get Darzi to fly a carry basket at all, much less to do so breaking a record and in bad weather. Darzi was not a silver. He was one of a new class of griffins who are primarily athletes. Whether as aerobats, fast couriers, or actual racers, these griffins earned a very fine, even luxurious living by serving the highly appetite for speed and spectacle. Darzi was the best of the fast couriers, and one of the fastest racers. He was a more consistent flyer than griffins who actually clocked the occasional faster time. It was hard to imagine what hold Judith could have over him to induce him to risk injury and strain in this way. But maybe he was being uncharitable. Maybe Darzi had actually volunteered. Not without blackmail. It didn't matter, so long as Judith had gotten him, whether it was through bribery or blackmail or a combination of both. Maybe she's following my example. The gods know she has enough power of her own to leverage just about anyone in this city into doing her bidding at least once. Any questions? Judith asked and looked around the room. No? Right. Fall out. And for those of you who haven't slept, I'm calling Tamsin in to make you sleep. There was no doubt who she was targeting with the daggers of her gaze, and both Amber Drake and Scan flinched. But she wasn't finished. That includes me. We won't be any good to anyone if we aren't rested when the call comes. Right, Drake? Her question came as a surprise, and he was doubly surprised to sense the compassion and sympathy, and worry of her own behind the words. It penetrated even his defensiveness. Ah, right, he admitted sheepishly, relaxing just a trifle. So she does understand, and she's forgiven us. He had not hoped for it so soon, but he welcomed it as a tiny bright spot of hope in the midst of too much grief. Good, glad you agree because you're going to be one of the first to go to sleep. A commotion at the door proved to be bedding, food, and Tamsin, all arriving simultaneously. Now stand down, all of you, and get yourselves taken care of. I'll be watching to see that you do. And she did, standing over them like a slave master, to see that every member of the three search parties ate, drank, and submitted to Tamsin's touch. As Judith had warned, Amber Drake was one of the first, and after one look at Judith's expression, he knew better than to protest. So he crammed down a few mouthfuls of food as dry and tasteless as paper, drank what was given him, and laid himself down in a standard military-style sleeping roll. He closed his eyes as Tamsin leaned over him, and that was the last thing he knew until the rally call awakened him. Rain. Why did it have to be rain? Even snakes would be better. Scandranan tried to keep his thoughts on his purely physical discomfort, but try as he might, he couldn't. His skin crawled, and the rain had nothing to do with it. If Scan's feathers hadn't been plastered flat to his body, they'd have been standing up in instinctive alarm. He did not like this place, and his dislike was not connected in any way whatsoever with the miserable weather. It could have been that this bizarre, claustrophobic forest had swallowed Blade and Tad without a trace, but that wasn't the reason his soggy hackles were trying to rise either. The other mage of the party felt the same, and if there had been any choice in the matter, he'd have gone back to the base camp because it just plain felt wrong here. The two of them, after some discussion last night before the human took the first sleep shift, had decided that the problem was the lack of mage energy in this place. Presumably an apprentice-level mage or journeyman would not be affected in this way. They were not used to sensing and using energies outside themselves, unless those energies were fed to them by a mage of greater ability. But a master, as Scan and the human Silver Felix were, was as accustomed to the all-pervasive currents of mage energy as a griffin was to the currents of the air. Scan could not remember a time in his adult life that he had not been aware of those currents. Even when the mage storms had caused such disruptions in magic, the energy had never vanished, it just hadn't worked or felt quite the same. But having no mage energy about, 
It felt wrong. Very wrong. It had him disoriented and off balance, constantly looking for something that simply wasn't there. It feels as if I've suddenly lost a sense. Something subtle, like smell. Nevertheless, a quick trial had proved to his satisfaction that magic still worked here, and furthermore, those magical items that they had brought in with them were still empowered. Further checks proved that, at the moment at least, there was no ongoing drain of mage energy. The power that built up in any area naturally was slowly rising back up. So whatever was wrong in this forest, whatever had caused this anomaly, it had not completely negated magic, just removed it. Whether that drainage had been gradual or all at once was anyone's guess. And there must be something coming along to drain mage energy again as it built up, or there would be some areas that had at least a little power available. As for what that could be, he had no idea. He did not care to think about what must have happened if the basket had also had all of its empowering mage energy drained, all at once. Scandranum mentally worked on a few new phrases to use when he finally complained about it all to someone whom he could corral into listening sympathetically. He had a reputation for colourful language to maintain, after all. He would much rather concentrate on that than how miserable his soggy feathers felt, how cold he was, how sore his muscles were after two days of walking. That was something he simply hadn't considered, and it was galling to realise that Drake was in better physical shape than he was. Drake had been climbing the stairs and ladders of White Griffin for almost twenty years. He had only been flying. He could not think of more than a handful of times that he had actually climbed up rather than down, and none of those times had been in the last three years. At least Keith had been working out on the obstacle course lately, and Winterheart had made certain that all muscles were exercised. Poor Janiel must be as miserable as he. But she has the best Trondion in the city to tend her. Keith is a Trondion. Only have Drake, who does his best, but still, he's preoccupied. Rain dripped into his nares and he sneezed to clear them, shaking his head fiercely. He and Drake were at the rear of the party. With his keener sense of hearing than the humans possessed, it seemed a good idea to have him at the back where he might be able to detect something following them. Now he wished he had thought to ask Judith for a couple of Kyrie scouts for each party. They would have been much more effective than any of the humans. Rain poured down out of the sky, as it had since the fog lifted that morning. This was a truly lovely climate. Fog from before dawn to just after, followed by rain until well past darkness, followed by damp chill until the fog came again in the morning. Judith had been absolutely right in grounding them, and he would have grounded himself once he saw the weather. There was no way for a griffin to fly safely in this muck, even if he could get his wings dry long enough to take off. Darcy had managed to bring his mage in safely only because he was insanely self-confident and lucky enough for four griffins, and because the weather changed abruptly to something more like a normal rainy season outside of the no-magic area. That and Darcy is young enough to think he's immortal, and good enough to fly as if he were. Like another stupid, stupid griffin I used to know. In spite of the fact that the rainy season was normal back at the base camp, normal still meant a raging thunderstorm every afternoon. Darcy had flown and landed in one of those thunderstorms, blithely asserting that it was all a matter of timing and watching where the bolts hit. His passenger had been white-lipped but remarkably reticent about discussing the flight. Drake had found out what had tempted Darcy into making the trip. A challenge. Judith had asked the young griffin if he knew of anyone who might be persuaded, and had hinted broadly that she didn't think he could do it. That had been enough for Darcy, who had insisted that he and only he could manage the trip. And he had, in record-breaking time and without damaging himself or his passenger. For sheer speed, audacity, and insane courage, that flight had surpassed even some of the Black Griffin's legendary accomplishments. Some, but not all. Darcy will just have to take his own time to become a legend, and if he is wise, he will do it in his own way and not try to emulate me. I think that my life must have used up the luck of twenty Griffins. Scan, the base camp crew, and the other twenty-three rescuers had piled through the gate in a record-setting time of their own. Although no people had been pitched through, all the supplies had been, hurled in a mass by a small army of Judith's support crew. Not even during a resupply had Scan ever seen a gate go up and down again so quickly. Darcy flew home to receive his justly earned accolades and the admiration of every unattached female in the city. The results of that would likely be more exhausting for him than the great deed itself. The gate mage and his helpers and guards remained to set up a base camp. The rest of them had shouldered packs and moved out under the beginnings of a rainstorm. 
No one had told them, however, that they were going to have to climb down a cliff to get into the forest where the children were lost. The three griffins had shaken themselves dry and flown themselves down, but the humans had been forced to get to the bottom the hard way. That experience in a worsening thunderstorm had been exciting enough to age even the most hardened veteran in the lot. Absolutely everything they touched was slippery, either with mud, water or substances they were probably better off not knowing about. Once at the bottom, the three parties had formed up and gone their separate ways, and Scan had been amazed at how quickly the forest had swallowed the other two search parties. In an amazingly short period of time, he couldn't even hear the faintest sound of the others, only the steady drumming of the rain and the whistles, chirps and calls of creatures up in the tops of the trees. Each day had been much like the one before it, only the navigator knew for certain that they were going in the right direction and not in circles. The only time that Scan was ever dry was just before he slept. The moment he poked his beak out of the tent, he shared with Drake and the other mage he was wet. Either fog condensed on his feathers and soaked into them, or it just got soaked directly by the usual downpour. Just at the moment, the downpour had him wet to the skin, and he was depressed, though he would have been depressed without the rain. How can we ever hope to find any sign of them? he asked himself, staring up at the endless sea of dripping leaves and around at the dizzying procession of tree trunks on all sides, tangled with vines or shrouded with brush. There wasn't a sign of a game trail, and as for game itself, well, he'd had to feed himself by surprising some of the climbing creatures in the mornings, while he could still fly. They could be within shouting distance of us, and we would never know it. This forest was not only claustrophobic, it was uncannily enveloping. One of the fighters swore that he could actually see the plants growing, and Scan could find it in his heart to believe him. How long would it take until vines and bushes covered anything left after a crash? A few days? A week? It had been a week since the children went missing, maybe more than a week. He lost track of time in here and they could have been down for three or four days before that. Gloomy thoughts, as gloomy as their surroundings, and yet he could not give up. As long as there was any chance, however minuscule, that they would find the children, he would search on. No matter what, he had to know what had happened to them. The uncertainty of not knowing was the worst part. Drake looked like Scan felt. The Kestra Chan was a grim-faced, taciturn, sodden, muddy mess most of the time, he spoke only when spoken to, tended to the minor injuries of the party without being asked, but offered nothing other than physical aid, which was utterly unlike him. He hiked with the rest of them, or dealt with camp chores, but it was obvious that his mind was not on what he was doing. It was out there, somewhere, and Scan wondered if Drake was trying to use his limited empathic ability as a different kind of North Needle, searching for the pole star of pain and distress hidden among the trunks and vines. With a blood tie between himself and his daughter, he should be especially sensitive to her. If she were alive, he might be able to find her where conventional methods were failing. More power to him. He's never tried using it that way, but that doesn't mean it won't work. Scan only wished he had a similar ability he could exercise. As it was, he was mostly a beast of burden, and otherwise not much help. He couldn't track, he couldn't even use magic without depleting himself, and as for anything else, well his other talents all involved flying and he could only fly for a short time in the mornings. Regan, the leader in their party, held up a hand, halting them, as he had done several times already that day. There didn't seem to be any reason for this behaviour, and Scan was getting tired of it. Why stop and stand in the rain for no cause? The more ground they covered, the better chance they had of finding something. He nudged past Felix and splashed his way up to the weather-beaten silver Judith had placed in charge. Regan, just what exactly are we waiting for? he asked, none too politely. Fortunately, the man ignored the sarcastic tone of his voice and answered the question by pointing upward. Scan looked, just in time to see their scout burn sliding down the trunk of a tree ahead of them with a speed that made Scan wince. Burn's been looking for breaks in the trees ahead, Regan said, as Burn made a hand signal and strode off into the trees. We figure, if the basket came down it had to make a hole. That hole'll still be there. He gets up into a tall tree and looks for holes all around, especially if he can see they're fresh. You might not believe it with all these clouds around, but if there's a break in the trees, more light gets in, and you can see it from high enough in the canopy. That's what we're waiting on. Burn reappeared a moment later and rejoined the party, shaking his head. Scan didn't have to know the silver signals to read that one. No holes. He and Regan had a quick conference with the navigator, and the scout headed back off into the forest on a new bearing. 
the rest of the party followed in Byrne's wake. So far, there had been no sign of anything following or watching them, much less any attacks. Scan was beginning to think that Judith's insistence on assuming there was a hostile entity in here was overreaction on her part. There hadn't been any signs that anything lived in here but wild animals. Surely whatever had drained off all the mage energy here must be a freak phenomenon. Maybe that was what had caught the two children. Scan dropped back to his former place beside Amberdrake, but with a feeling of a little more hope, brought on by the knowledge that at least they weren't totally without a guide or a plan. Drake still seemed sunk into himself, but he revived a bit when Scan returned and explained what the lead members were up to. I've had worse ideas, he said thoughtfully, wiping strands of sodden hair out of his eyes and blinking away the rain. It's not a griffin's eye view, but it's better than nothing. Once again the leader signaled a stop. Scan peered out and up through the curtains of rain, but he couldn't see anything. Wherever the scout was this time, not even Scan's excellent eyes could pick him out. I've no idea how Byrne is managing to climb in this weather, much less how he's doing it so quickly. Scan moved up a few feet and ducked around a tangle of vines, but the view was no better from the new vantage. He must be as limber as one of those little furry climbers that Charlemagne keeps at his palace as pets. For all we know, this sort of place is where those come from. Drake shrugged dismissively, as if the subject held no interest for him. I... Hoy! Scan looked up again, startled, and just caught sight of the tiny figure above waving frantically. He seemed to be balanced on a thick tree limb, and clung to the trunk with only one hand. The other hand waved wildly, and then pointed. Hoy! The call came again. Fresh break! That way! Fresh break? The same thought occurred to all of them, but the Silvers were quicker to react than Scan or Drake. They broke into a trot, shoving their way through the vegetation, leaving the other two to belatedly stumble along in their wake. Scan's heart raced, and not from the exertion. He longed to gallop on ahead, and probably would have, except that it was all he could do to keep up with the Silvers. And much to his embarrassment, just as he developed a sudden stitch in his side, Byrne, the scout who'd been up in the tree, burst through the underbrush behind them, overtook them, and plunged onto the head of the column. Show off. Another shout echoed back through the trees, muffled by the falling rain. The words weren't distinguishable, but the tone said all Scan needed to know. There was excitement, but no grief, no shock. They found something. Something and not someone, or worse, bodies. From some reserve he didn't know he had, he dredged up more strength and speed, and turned his trot into a series of leaps that carried him through the underbrush until he broke through into the clearing beneath the break in the trees. He stumbled across the remains of a crude palisade of brush and onto clear ground. A camp. That was his first elated thought. If the children had been able to build a camp, they could not have been too badly hurt. Then he looked at the kind of camp it was, and felt suddenly faint. This was no orderly camp. This was something patched together from the remains of wreckage and whatever could be scavenged. Regan looked up from his examination of the soggy remains of the basket, as Scan halted inside the periphery of the clearing. They crashed here, all right. He pointed upward, at the ragged gap in the canopy. They're gone now, but they did hit here, hard enough to smash two sides of the basket. They both survived it, though I can't guess how. Maybe there was enough in the way of branches on the way down to slow their fall. The medical kit's gone. There's signs they both used it. They were here. They were hurt. Now they're gone. But why? Why aren't they still here? He asked, speaking his bewilderment aloud. Now that is a good question. Regan poked through a confusion of articles that looked as if they'd just been tossed there and left. Standard advice is to stay with your wrecked craft if you have an accident. I'd guess they started to do that. We're here for maybe two days. Then something made them leave. It looks to me as if they left in a hurry, and yet I don't see any signs of a fight. They could have been frightened away, Amberdrake ventured. Or, well, this isn't a very good camp. It's a disaster of a camp, that's what it is, Regan corrected bluntly. But if all I had was wreckage, and I was badly hurt, I probably wouldn't have been able to do much better. It's shelter, though, and that isn't quite enough. I wish I knew how much of their supplies got ruined, and how much they took with them. He straightened and looked around, frowning. There's no sign of a struggle, but no sign of game around here either. They might have run out of food, and it would be hard to hunt if they were hurt. There's no steady water source. Amberdrake coughed politely. We're under a steady water source, 
he pointed out. Regan just shrugged. We're taught not to count on rain. So, no game, no water, and an indefensible camp. Griffins eat a lot. If their supplies were all trashed, they'd be good for about two days before they were garbage, unfit to eat. After that, they've got to find game, for Tadrith alone. My guess is, they stayed here just long enough to get back some strength, and headed back in the direction of home. They're probably putting up signals now. He grimaced. I just hope their trail isn't too cold to follow, but on the other hand, if they headed directly west, we should stay pretty much on their trail. That's where I'd go, back to the river. It's a lot easier to fish if you're hurt than to hunt. Skang groaned. You mean we could have just followed the river and we probably would have found them? Regan grinned sourly. That's exactly what I mean. But look on the bright side. Now we know they're alive and they're probably all right. Scan nodded, as Regan signaled to Byrne to start hunting for a trail. But as Byrne searched for signs, Scan couldn't help noticing a few things. For one thing, the piles of discarded material had a curiously ordered, disordered look about them, as if they'd been tossed everywhere, then gathered up and crudely examined, then sorted. For another, there were no messages, notes, or anything of the sort to give a direction to any rescuers. Granted, the children might not have known whether anyone would find the camp, but shouldn't they have left something? And last of all, there was no magic, none at all, left in any of the discarded equipment. So the surmise had been correct. Something had drained all of the magic out of their gear, and from the signs of the crash, it had happened all at once. And yet none of the search party gear had been affected. Yet. So what had done this in the first place? What had sorted through the remains of the camp? And what had made the children flee into the unknown and trackless forest without even leaving a sign for searchers to follow? Was the answer to the third question the same as the answer to the other two? Tad entered the cave, sloshing through ankle-deep water at the entrance, carefully avoiding Blade's three fishing lines. Blade held up some of her catch, neatly strung, and he nodded appreciatively. Water's higher, he told her. In places it covers the trail here. That was to be expected, considering how much is falling out of the sky. Well, Blade said with resignation, at least we have a steady water supply, and we don't have to leave the cave to fish anymore. It had not stopped raining for more than a few marks in the middle of the night ever since they'd arrived here. She'd wondered what the rainy season would be like. Well, now she knew. The stream of water running down the middle of the cave had remained at about the same size, only its pace had quickened. The river had risen, and now it was perfectly possible for them to throw lines into the river itself without going past the mouth of the cave, with a reasonable expectation of catching something. That was just as well, since they were now under siege, although they still had not seen their hunters clearly. The flitting shadows espied in the undergrowth had made it very clear that there was no getting back across the river without confronting them. Tad nodded, spreading his good wing to dry it in front of the fire. He had gone out long enough to drag in every bit of driftwood he could find, and there was now a sizable store of it in the cave. He'd also hauled in things that would make a thick, black smoke, and they had a second, extremely nasty fire going now. It stood just to one side of the stream, at the rear of the cave, putting a heavy smoke up the natural chimney. Whether or not there was anyone likely to see it was a good question. This was not the kind of weather anything but a desperate or suicidal griffin would fly in. On the other hand, how desperate would Scandranan or Tad's twin be by now? Desperate enough to try? Blade both hoped so, and hoped that they would have more sense. Their pursuers were getting bolder, and she hadn't particularly wanted Tad to go out this afternoon. The stalkers were still nothing more than menacing shadows, but she had seen them skulking through the underbrush on the other side of the river, even by day, yesterday and this morning. I think they might try something tonight. Tad said far too casually. I know I was being watched all the time, and I just had that feeling as if there was something out there that was frustrated and losing patience. I got the same feeling, Blade confessed. She hadn't enjoyed taking her shields down and making a tentative try at assessing what lay beyond the river, but it had felt necessary. In part she'd been hoping to sense a rescue party, but the cold and very alien wave of frustrated anger that met her tentative probe had made her shut herself up behind her shields and sit there shivering for a moment. I tried using that empathic sense, and I got the same impression you did. They would like very much to get a chance at us. She hoped that Tad wouldn't make too big a fuss about that confession. 
He'd been at her often enough to use everything she had. Now she'd finally given in to his urgings. She was not in the mood for an, I told you that was a good idea. She wasn't certain that it was a good idea. What if those things out there had been able to sense her just as she sensed them? Then again, what would they learn? That she was hurt and scared spitless of them? They already knew that. Fortunately for him, Tad just nodded. It's good to know that it's not just my own worry talking to me, he said inside. Now I don't feel so badly about setting all those traps. What? she began. At that moment, one of her fishing lines went tight, and she turned her attention to it long enough to haul in her catch. But after rebaiting the hook and setting the line again, she returned to the subject. What other traps do you think would work? she asked. On our side of the river, that is. Where could we set more? Thus far, they hadn't had any luck with deadfalls like the one that had marked one of the shadows before. It was as if, having seen that particular sort of trap, the hunters now knew how to avoid it. Large snares hadn't worked either, but she hadn't really expected them to, since there was no way to conceal them. But perhaps now, with water over the trail, tripwires could be hidden under the water. I attended to that during my walk earlier. There's only one good place, really, he told her. The river's gotten so deep and fast that there's only one place where I think they might try to cross. That's downstream, past where we crossed it when we first got here. I didn't set a trap right there, though. What I did was rig something that's harmless but looks like the rockfall I rigged later on. He griff-grinned at his own cleverness, and she could hardly blame him. So they'll see the harmless decoy and then walk right into the rockfall. He nodded, looking very proud of himself. It's a good big one, too. If they actually try coming after us, at least one of them is going to be seriously hurt or killed, unless they've got lightning reflexes and more luck than any one creature deserves to have. Just as long as you don't hurt someone coming to rescue us, she warned. Yesterday she might have argued with him about the merits of setting something meant to kill, rather than discourage, but that was before she had opened herself to the creatures across the river. She still might not know what they looked like, but now she knew what they were. Killers plainly and simply, with a kind of cold intelligence about them that made her wish for one good bow, two good arms and three dozen arrows. She would debate the merits of permitting such creatures the free run of their own territory, some other time, and if they gave up and left her alone, she would be perfectly happy to leave them alone. But if they came after her or Tad, she would strike as efficiently and with the same deadly force as they would. There was still the question of whether or not these creatures were the hunting pack, of someone or something else. She did not have the ability to read thoughts, even if these creatures had anything like a thought, but she hadn't sensed anything else out there with them. All of the creatures had been of the same type, with a definite feeling of pack about them, which could simply mean that their master was off, lounging about at his ease somewhere, watching all of this in a scrying mirror. That would certainly fit the profile of a sadistic adept, she couldn't picture Ma'a, for instance, subjecting himself to mud and pouring rain. If that was so, if there was an adept behind all of this, and she ever got her hands on him. That wasn't the only trap I built, Tad continued proudly, oblivious to her dark thoughts. I have trip tangles under the water that will throw them into the stream, a balanced boulders to roll at a touch and trap feet and legs, and I put up some more snares. Between all that and the rock barricade we have across the front of the cave— I think we can feel a little safer. Just as long as we can continue fishing from in here, she corrected, and as long as you can stand to live on fish. All I have to do is think about eating any more of that dried meat, and fish takes on a whole new spectrum of delight, he countered. I'm learning to tell the difference between one fish and another, raw. Some are sweeter, one has more fat, and they all taste the same to me. Fine, I believe you, she interrupted hastily. Listen, I wonder if we could rig some kind of a net or something to haul in driftwood as it comes down over the falls. There's a lot of stuff getting by us that we could really use. There was nothing that Tad liked better than trying to invent a new way to do something, and the idea of a driftwood net kept him happily occupied for some time. And more importantly, it kept him restfully occupied. No matter how cheerful and energetic he seemed or tried to appear, he was tired, and so was she. The ever-present roar of the falls would cover the sounds of anything approaching them, and most especially would cover the sounds of anything bold enough to try swimming across the river at this point. They both knew that, and she suspected that he was staying half awake even through her watch, as she was staying through his. Not especially bright of either of them, but neither of them were able to help themselves. 
Their imaginations supplied the creatures out there with every kind of supernatural attribute, especially in the dark of the night. It was easy to dismiss such fears by daylight, except that she kept reminding herself that just because their hunters hadn't done something yet, that didn't mean they weren't capable of a particular action. It was hard to strike a balance between seeing threats that didn't exist and not being wary enough, especially when you didn't know everything the enemy could do. Not long until dark, Tad observed, after a long discussion of nets and drag lines and other ways of catching runaway driftwood. He pointed his beak toward the river. She nodded, although it was difficult to keep track of time without the sun being visible. The light did seem to be fading. Another one of her lines went taut. This fish was a fighter, which probably meant it was one of the kinds Tad liked best. Any fish seemed pretty tasteless to her, wrapped in wet clay to bake and without any herbs to season it with. She thought about using some of the peppery leaves just to give her food some spice, then thought better of the idea. Although they had not had any deleterious effect rubbed on the skin, there was no telling if they were poisonous if eaten. You could rub your skin all day with shadow berries and not get anything worse than a purple stain, but eat a few and you would find yourself retching up your toenails. She fought the fish to exhaustion and reeled it in, hand over hand, taking care not to tangle the line. That was enough for tonight. She pulled in the other lines, and by the time she was done, there was no doubt. It was darker out on the river. She took the fish back behind the rock barrier, to the fire, where Tad still basked. Each day they added a few more rocks, but they were rapidly approaching the point where they wouldn't be able to use river clay as mortar anymore. It just wasn't strong enough. There was another advantage to this cave. No bugs. Enough smoke hung in the air from their signal fire to discourage insects of all sorts. Her bites had finally begun to heal and didn't bother her too much anymore. In fact, if it hadn't been for those watchers out there, she would be feeling pretty pleased with the state of things. They had fire, excellent shelter, and plenty to eat. And sooner or later, someone from White Griffin or even Kimbata would see or smell the signal fire, and they could go home. And in the meantime, while they were not comfortable, they were secure. She took one of the big, sluggish bottom feeders from her string, gutted it, wrapped it in wet clay, put it in the fire pit and raked coals and ashes over it. The rest she handed to Tad as they were. No longer as famished as he was when they first got here, he ate them with gusto, and if he lacked fine table manners, she was not going to complain about the company. I can think of worse people to be stranded with. How's the wing? she asked, as she did at least once a day. It doesn't hurt as much as it did yesterday, but I still don't want to unwrap it, he replied. Whenever I move in an unusual way, it hurts. In Tad language, that meant, It hurts enough that my knees buckle and I almost pass out. She knew. She'd seen it happen. Tad was so stoic. He tried very hard to be cheerful, and it was likely for her benefit alone. By moving very carefully, she'd managed to keep the same thing from happening to her, but that meant a lot of restriction on her movement. If only she had two good hands, or he had two good wings. If either of them could manage to get to the top of the cliff, she was sure they could think of a way to bring the other up afterward. Up there, they wouldn't have to worry about pursuit anymore. If the hunters couldn't climb a tree, they sure as stars couldn't climb a cliff. Might as well wish for three or four experienced silvers with long-range bows, she thought grimly. I have the feeling that there is something about all of this that I'm missing completely. Something that should be obvious but isn't. I just wish I had a clue to what it is. Do you really think they're going to try something tonight? she asked, more to fill the silence than because she thought he'd changed his mind. For an answer, he nodded toward the cave entrance. Rain slackening early. The current isn't bad in that one wide shallow spot. Not that hard to wade across, if you've got claws to hang onto the rock with. And we already know they do have claws. She wondered if she ought to try opening herself up to them a second time, then decided against it. They could be waiting for her to do exactly that. Silence fell between them again, and she just didn't feel right about breaking it with small talk. She checked her fish instead, and found the clay rock hard. That was a good indication that the fish inside was done, so she went ahead, raked it out of the coals and broke it open. The skin and scales came away with the clay, leaving the steaming white flesh ready to eat without all the labour of skinning or scaling. She made fairly short work of it. As usual, it tasted like... not much of anything... Visceral memories of hot, fresh bread smothered in sweet butter, spicy meat and bean soup, and that incredible garlic and onion-laced fish stew that Jewel made, taunted her until she drove them from her mind. 
After that, they let the fire die down to coals and banked them with ashes to reduce the amount of light in the cave. If the hunters were going to try something tonight, there was no point in giving them the advantage of being able to see their targets clearly silhouetted. She moved toward the barricade by edging along the side of the cave to keep herself in the shadows as much as possible. Tad did the same on the other side. The rain had indeed slackened off early for once. Instead of illuminating a solid sheet of water in front of her nose, the intermittent flashes of lightning showed the other side of the river, with the churning, rolling water between. There was no sign of anything on the other side of the river, and that wasn't good. Up until now, there had always been at least one lurking shadow in the bushes over there. Now there was nothing, That was just one more indication that Tad's instincts and her reading of the hunter's impatience were both correct. They were going to try something tonight. She glanced over at Tad. When lightning flickered, she could see his head and neck clearly. Although he was so still, he could have passed for a carving. He kept his eyelids lowered so that not even a flicker of reflection would betray his presence to anything watching. His natural coloration blended beautifully with the stone behind him, and the lines of his feathers passed for rock striations. It was amazing just how well camouflaged he was. His ear tufts lay flat along his head, but she knew better than to assume that meant he wasn't listening. The ear tufts were largely decorative tufts of feathers that had nothing to do with his hearing. Now he was listening all right. She wondered how much he could hear over the roar of the waterfall beside them. But when the noise of his trap coming down thundered across the river, it was not at all subtle. In fact, it was loud enough that even the rock of the cave mouth vibrated for a moment. She jumped, her nerves stretched so tight that she went off balance for a moment and had to twist to catch herself with her good hand. She regained her balance quickly and moved to go outside. He shot out a claw, catching her good wrist and holding her where she was. Wait until morning, he advised in a voice just loud enough for her to hear it over the roaring water. That killed something, and they aren't going to be able to move the body. How much rock did you pile up? she asked incredulously. How had he been able to pile up anything with only a pair of talons instead of hands and with one bad wing? Enough, he replied, then chuckled with pardonable pride. I didn't want to boast until I knew it had worked, but I used a little magic to undermine part of the cliff face that was ready to go. I honestly didn't know how much was going to come down. I only knew it would be more than I could manage by stacking rocks. From the sound of it, a lot came down, she answered in awe. What a brilliant application of a very tiny amount of magic. Did you feel it through the rock? He nodded. There could be a problem, though, he added. I might have given them a bridge, or half a bridge across the river. There was that chance that the rock would fall that way. But she shrugged philosophically. If he had, he had. It might well be worth it to find out just what, precisely, had been stalking them all this time. And the cliff could have come down by itself, doing the same thing, she answered. There's no point in getting upset until we know. I doubt that we're going to see any further trouble out of them for tonight, anyway. She was quite right. The rest of the night was as quiet as anyone could have wished, and with the first light, they both went out to see what, if anything, Tad's trap had caught. When they got to the rockfall, they both saw that it had indeed come sliding down into the river, providing a bridge about halfway across, though some of it had already washed farther downstream. But as they neared it, and saw that the trap had caught a victim, Blade was just as puzzled by what was trapped there as she had been by the shadows. There had been some effort made to free the creature, that much showed in the signs of digging and the obvious places where rubble and even large stones had been moved off the carcass. But it was not a carcass of any animal she recognised. If a mage had taken a greyhound, crossed it with a serpent, and magnified it up to the size of a horse, he would have had something like this creature. A deep black in colour, with shiny scaled skin just like a snake or a lizard, and a long neck. It had teeth sharper and more dagger-like than a dog's. Its head and those of its limbs not crushed by the fallen rock were also dog-like. They couldn't tell what colour its eyes were. The exposed slit only showed an opaque white. She stared at it, trying to think if there was anything in all the stories she'd heard that matched it. But Tad had no such trouble putting a name to it. Why, sir, Tad muttered, but the colour's all wrong. She turned her head to see that he was staring down at the thing, and he seemed certain of his identification. "'What's a why, sir?' she asked sharply. He nudged the head with one cautious talon. "'One of the old adepts before Ma'a made things like this to mimic Kairi, and called them why, sir. He meant them for a more formidable guard dog or hunting pack, but they couldn't be controlled and got loose from him. Oh, a long time ago, 
long before Ma'ar and the war. Aubrey told me about hunting them, said they ran wild in packs in some places. His eyes narrowed as he concentrated, but the ones he talked about were smaller than this. They were white, and they had poison fangs and poison talons. She bent down carefully and examined the mouth and the one exposed foot for poison sacks, checking to see if either talons or teeth were hollow. She finally got a couple of rocks and carefully broke off a long canine tooth and a talon to examine them more closely. Finally, she stood up with a grunt. I don't know what else is different on these beasts, but they aren't carrying anything poisonous, she told him, as he watched her actions dubiously. Neither the teeth nor the claws are hollow. They have no channel to carry venom and no venom sacs at the root to produce poison in the first place. Venom has to come from somewhere, Tad, and it has to get into the victim somehow. So unless this creature has poisonous saliva... Aubrey distinctly said that they were just like a poisonous snake, Tad insisted. But the colour is different on these things and the size. Something must have changed them. They exchanged a look. A mage? she asked. Or the storms? She might know venom, but he knew magic. The mage storms, if anything at all, Tad said flatly. If a mage had changed wire so deliberately, he wouldn't have taken out the venom. He'd have made it worse. I'll bet it was the mage storms. I wouldn't bet against it. Blade knelt again to examine the head in detail. It was as long as her forearm, and most of it was jaw. Tad, these things don't need venom to hurt you, she pointed out. Look at those canines. They're as long as my finger, and the rest of the teeth are in proportion. What else do you know about the Wysa? He swallowed audibly. Aubrey said that the bigger the pack was, the smarter they acted, as if part of their intelligence was shared with every other one in the pack. He also said that they were unbelievably tenacious. If they got your scent, they'd track you for days, and if you killed or hurt one, they would track you forever. You'd never get rid of them until they killed you or you killed them all. How comforting, she said dryly, standing up again. And we've hurt one and killed one. I wish we'd known this before. Tad just shuffled his feet, looking sheepish. They might not connect us with the rockfall, he offered tentatively. Well, it's done, and can't be undone. She caught something, a hint of movement out of the corner of her eye, and turned her head. And froze. As if now that she and Tad knew what the things were, and the Wyasa saw no reason to hide, a group of six stood on the bank across from them, snarling silently. Tad let out his breath in a hiss of surprise and dismay. Then, before she could even blink or draw breath, they were gone. She hadn't even seen them move, but the only thing across from them now was a stand of bushes, the branches still quivering as the only sign that something had passed through them. I think we can safely assume that they do connect us with the rock fall, she replied, a chill climbing up her spine. And I think we'd better get back to the cave before they decide to try to cross the river again. Don't run, Tad cautioned, turning slowly and deliberately, and watching where he placed his feet. Aubrey said that would make them chase you, even if they hadn't been chasing you before. She tried to hide how frightened she was, but the idea of six or more of those creatures coming at her in the dark was terrifying. What charming and delightful creations, she said sarcastically. Anything else you'd like to tell me? He shook his head, spraying her with rain. That's all I remember right now. She concentrated on being very careful where she walked, for the rain was getting heavier and the rocks slicker. It would do no one any good if she slipped on these rocks and broke something else. Well, no one but the wire, sir. Has anyone ever been able to control these things? She asked, just out of curiosity. The navigable part of the track narrowed. He gestured to her to precede him, which she did. If the wire, sir, decided to cross the river, he did make a better rear guard than she did as soon as he got turned around. Not that I've ever heard of, he said from behind her. I suppose that a really good mage could hold a coercion spell on a few and make them attack a target he chose, but that would be about the limit of controlling them. He wouldn't be able to stop them once they started, and he wouldn't be able to make them turn aside if they went after something he didn't choose. I certainly wouldn't count on controlling them. So at least we probably don't have to worry about some mage setting this pack on our trail after bringing us down? She persisted, and stole a glance over her shoulder at him. His feathers were plastered flat to his head, making his eyes look enormous. Well... Not that I know of, he said hesitantly. But these aren't the same wires that I know. They've been changed. Maybe they are more tractable than the old kind. Maybe the poison was removed as a trade-off for some other powers, or it contributed to their uncontrollability. 
and a mage could have brought us down in their territory for amusement without needing to control them, just letting them do what they do. You're just full of good news today, aren't you? She growled, then repented. I shouldn't be taking our bad look out on him. Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm just not exactly in a good frame of mind right now. Neither am I, he said softly, in a voice in which she could clearly hear his fear. Neither am I. Tad kept a watch all day, as Blade concentrated on fishing. Once or twice a single wiser showed itself, but the creatures made no move to cross the river to get at them. Of course not. Night has always been their chosen hunting time, and that should be especially true of Wyasair with this new coloration. Swift, silent, and incredibly fierce, he would not have wanted to face one of this new type, much less an entire pack. I wonder how big the pack is anyway. Six? Ten? More? Were they the sport offering of a single female? Wyasair were only supposed to litter once every two years, and they didn't whelp more than a couple at a time. If these are all from twin offspring of a single litter, back when the storms changed them, how many could the pair have produced? Four years to maturity, then two pups every two years. They could be as few as the seven that they had seen, and as many as thirty or forty. The true answer was probably somewhere in between. He and Blade ate in silence, then she banked the fire down to almost nothing while he took the first watch. As soon as it was fully dark, he eased several rocks into place to disguise his outline, then pressed himself up against the stone of the floor as flat as he could. He hoped he could convince them that he wasn't there, that nothing was watching them from the mouth of the cave. If he could lure one out into the open, out on the slippery rocks of the riverbank, he might be able to get off a very simple bit of magic. If he could stun one long enough to knock it into the river, well, here below the falls it would get sucked under to drown. Nothing but a fish could survive the swirling currents right at the foot of the falls. That would be one less wiser to contend with. He didn't hear Blade so much as sense her. After a moment's hesitation, she touched his foot, then eased on up beside him. Couldn't sleep, she mouthed into his ear. He nodded. Stupid, maybe, but she had good cause for insomnia. She pressed herself even farther down against the stone than he had. Anything that spotted her from across the river would have to have better eyesight than an owl. The rain is slacking off. That was both good and bad news. He had an idea that the wires had didn't much care for rain, and that they were averse to climbing around on rain-slick rocks. Like him, they had talons, but he didn't think that their feet were as flexible as his. Those talons could make walking on rock difficult. On the other hand, as the rain thinned, that made visibility across the river better, especially if the lightning kept up without any rain falling. Something moved on the bank across from his position. He froze, and he felt Blade hold her breath. Lightning flickered, and the light fell on a sleek, black form, poised at the very edge of the bank, peering intently in their direction. And now he saw that the white glazing of the dead one's eyes had been the real colour. The Wyasa's eyes were a dead, opaque, corpse white. The very look of them, as the creature peered across the river in their direction, made his skin crawl. He readied his spell, hoarding his energies. No point in striking unless everything was perfect. He willed the creature to remain, to lean forward more. Lightning flickered again. It was still there, still craning its neck, peering. Stay. Stay. Now. He unleashed the energy, saw the wires a start, its eyes widening. But instead of dropping over, stunned, it glowed for a moment. Blade gasped, so Tad knew that she had seen it too, as a feeling of faintness and disorientation that he had experienced once before came over him. He wheezed and blinked a few times, dazzled, refocusing on the wiser. The wiser gaped its mouth. Then, as if recharged, the creature made a tremendous leap into the underbrush that nothing wholly natural could have duplicated, and was gone. And with it went the energy of the spell. If the wiser had deflected it, the energy would still be there, dissipating. It hadn't. The spell hadn't hit shields, and it hadn't been reflected. It had been inhaled, absorbed completely, and what was more, an additional fraction of Tad's personal mage energy had gotten pulled along behind it as if swept in a current. Oh, my gods, he breathed, feeling utterly stunned. Now he knew what had hit them, out there over the forest. And now he knew why the Wyasa had begun following them in the first place. 
The YSR were the mage thieves, not some renegade mage, not some natural phenomena. They ate magic or absorbed it, and it made them stronger. Blade shook him urgently. What happened? She hissed in his ear. What's the matter? What's going on? He shook off his paralysis to explain it to her. She knew enough about magic and how it worked that he didn't have to explain things twice. Goddess. She lay there, just as stunned for a moment as he was. And then in typical fashion, she summed up their entire position in two sentences. They have our scent, they want our blood, and now they know that you produce magic on top of all that. She stared at him, aghast, her eyes wide. We're going to have to kill them all, or we'll never get away from here. 9. Tad hissed at the cluster of Wyasa across the river. The Wyasa all bared their formidable teeth and snarled back. They made no move to vanish this time, and Tad got the distinct impression that they were taunting him, daring him to throw something magical at them. Well, of course they were. They had no reason to believe he had anything that could reach across the river except magic, and they wanted him to throw that. Throw us more food, stupid griffin. Throw us the very thing that makes us stronger, and make it tasty. He'd already checked a couple of things in their supplies. The stone he had made into a mage light and the fire starter he had re-energized were both inert again. If he'd needed any confirmation of the fact that these were the creatures that had sucked all of the mage energy out of the carry basket and everything in it, well, he had it. I wonder what father would do in a situation like this. But Scan would not likely have ever found himself in a situation like this one. Nor would his solution necessarily have been a good one, since it likely would have involved a great deal of semi-suicidal straight-on combat and high-energy physical action, which he was not in the least in any shape to perform. Scandranum was more known for his physicality than his raw inventiveness when it came right down to facts. Oh, Tad, not you too. Now you're even comparing yourself to your father. The real question is not what my father would do. The real question is, what am I going to do in this situation? He raised himself up as high in his hindquarters as he could get, and gave a battle scream, presenting the wire with an open beak and a good view of his foreclaws. They stopped snarling and eyed him warily, with a little more respect, he thought. He hoped. I wish you wouldn't do that, Blade emerged from the back of the cave where she'd been napping, hair tousled and expression sour. It's a bad way to wake up, thinking that your partner is about to engage in mortal combat. They don't seem to like the look of my claws, he replied, trying to sound apologetic without actually apologising. I was hoping I could intimidate them a little more. He studied the knot of wire, sir, which never seemed to be still for more than an eye blink. They were constantly moving, leaping, bending, twining in, around, over and under each other. He'd never seen creatures with so much energy and so much determination to use it. It was almost as if they physically couldn't stay still for more than a heartbeat. They'd come out of the underbrush about the time that the fog lifted and the rains began. If the rain bothered them now, it certainly wasn't possible to tell. Then again, why should it bother them? That it did have been an assumption on his part, not a reflection of what was really going on in those narrow snake-like heads. They had neither fur nor feathers to get wet and matted down, the only effect that rain had on their scales was to make them shiny. On first blush, I'd say they don't look very intimidated, Blade pointed out. But her brows knitted as she watched the wiresome move, and her eyes narrowed in concentration. On the other hand, that's a very effective defensive strategy, isn't it? Tad gazed at the stalker's glistening hides, the way it moved and flashed. The patterns they moved in, knotted and re-knotted, like a decorative interlace. Is it? But it bunches them all up in one place. Shouldn't that make it easier to hit one? He watched them carefully, then suddenly shook himself as he realized that the creature's constant movement was making him go into a trance. He glanced over a blade. She lifted an eyebrow and nodded. Not bad if you can put your attacker to sleep, hmm? She asked, then smiled slyly, which put Tad instantly on the alert. He'd seen that smile before, and he knew what it meant. Trouble, usually for someone else. Well, let's see if we can take advantage of their bit of cleverness, shall we? Stay there and look impressive, why don't you? I need something to keep them distracted. She retreated into the cave. The wiser continued their hypnotic weaving as Tad watched them, this time prepared to keep from falling under their spell, glancing away at every mental count of ten. 
duck, came the calm order from behind him. He dropped to the floor and a heavy lead shot zinged over him, through the space where his head had been. Across the stream one of the wires squalled and bit the one nearest it. The second retaliated and tattered the impression that it looked both surprised and offended at the unprovoked attack. The weaving knot was becoming unraveled as the two offended parties snapped and hissed one another. Another lead shot followed quickly, and a third wiresir hissed and joined what was becoming a melee. That seemed to be more provocation than the others could resist, and the knot became a tumbling tangle of quarrelling wiresir, with nothing graceful, coordinated or hypnotic about it. Now most of the knot was involved in the fight, except for a loner who extricated itself from the snarling, hissing pack. This creature backed up slowly, eyeing the others with what was clearly surprise, and Blade's third shot thudded right into its head. It dropped in its tracks, stunned, while the rest of the group continued to squabble, squall, and bite. Blade stepped back into the front of the cave and watched the wire so with satisfaction. I wonder just how cohesive that pack was. I also wonder how long it's going to take them to associate a distance weapon with us. I doubt that they've ever seen or experienced one before. At just that moment, another one of the creatures emerged from the bushes and uttered a cry that was part hiss, part deep-throated growl. The reaction to this was remarkable and immediate. The others stopped fighting instantly and dropped to the ground, groveling in submission. The new wiser ignored them, going instead to the one that Blade had brought down, sniffing at it, then nipping its hindquarters to bring it groggily to its feet. I'd say the pack leader just arrived, Tad said. The new wiser swung its head around as he spoke and glared at him from across the river. The dead white eyes skewered him, holding him in place entirely against his will, while the wiresir's lip lifted in a silent snarl. The eyes glowed faintly, and his thoughts slowed to a sluggish crawl. Tad felt exactly like a bird caught within striking distance of a snake, unable to move even to save his own life. It was a horrible feeling of cold dread, one that made his extremities feel icy. At just that moment, Blade stepped between them and leveled a malevolent glare of her own at the pack leader. In a calm, clear voice, she suggested that the wiser in question could do several highly improbable, athletically difficult, and possibly biologically impractical things involving its own mother, a few household implements, and a dead fish. Tad blinked as his mind came back to life again when the wiser took its eyes off him. He'd had no idea Blade's education had been that liberal. The wiser might not have understood the words, but the tone was unmistakable. It reared back, as if it were going to accept the implied challenge, by leaping across the river, or leaping into it and swimming across, and Blade let another stone fly from her sling. This one cracked the pack leader across the muzzle, breaking a tooth with a wet snap. The creature made that strange noise of hiss and yelp that Tad had heard the night one got caught in his deadfall. It whirled and turned on the others, driving them away in front of it with a ragged squeal, and a heartbeat later, the riverbank was empty. Blade tucked her sling back into her pocket and rubbed her bad shoulder thoughtfully. I don't know if that was a good idea or a bad one. We aren't going to be able to turn them against each other again, but at least they know now that we have something that can hit them from a distance besides magic. And you certainly made an impression on the leader, Tad observed, cocking his head to one side. She smiled faintly. Just making it clear which of us is the meanest bitch in the valley, she replied lightly. Well, hadn't you noticed the leader was female? Uh, actually, no, I hadn't. He felt his nares flush with chagrin at being so caught in the creature's spell that he completely missed something so obvious. She's uh, really not my type. Her grin widened. Makes me wonder if the reason she's keeping the pack here has less to do with the fact that we killed one of her pups than it does with her infatuation with you, or rather, with your magnificent... physique. Her eyes twinkled wickedly. Whether or not she realises it, she's definitely recovering. But I wonder if I ought to break something else, just for the sake of a little peace. He coughed. I think not, he replied, flushing further with embarrassment. Oh no? But Blade let it drop. This was hardly the time and place to skewer him with further wit. Although when they got out of this, he had the feeling that she would not have forgotten this incident, or her own implications. You know, she continued, if we had even a chance of picking her off, the pack might lose its cohesiveness. At the very least, they'd be spending as much time squabbling over the leadership position as stalking us. He scratched to the side of his head thoughtfully. She had a good point. We have to be able to see them, to pick one particular wiser. 
he pointed out. And traps and rockfalls are likely to get the least experienced, not the most. But it does account for why they're being so persistent and tenacious. Uh Uh-huh. We got one of her babies, probably. Blade sank down on the stone floor of the cave and watched the underbrush across the river. He turned his attention in that direction himself and was rewarded by the slight movement of a bit of brush. Since there wasn't a breeze at the moment, he concentrated on that spot and was able to make out a flash of dark, shiny hide before the creature moved again. Interesting. Blade chewed on a nail and regarded the brush with narrowed eyes. I don't think we're going to see them out in the open again. They learn quickly. That quickly? That was impressive, but he called to mind what Aubrey had told him about the pack's collective intelligence. If there were many more than just the knot that he'd seen, it would mean that as a group, the pack might be as smart as a macaw, and that was pretty smart. Regardless of what father claims. The bushes moved again, and he caught another glimpse of slick, black hide. A cross of greyhound and snake. I can't imagine anything more bizarre. But then Blade would tell me that my imagination isn't very good. I wonder what kind of vision they get out of those strange eyes. Can they see in the dark? Could that white film be a screen they pull across their eyes to protect them from daylight? Can they actually see magic or scent it? I wonder what we look like to them, he said, musing aloud. Blade shot him a sharp glance. I suppose I looked fairly harmless until I whipped out my sling, she replied. But I suspect that you look like a movable feast. After all, you are burdened with a magical nature, and it might be rather obvious to them. You mean, they might be more interested in me than you as prey? He choked. She nodded. Probably, as someone they'd want to keep alive a while so they could continue to feed on your magic as it rebuilt. They're probably bright enough for that. He hadn't thought about that. It did not make him feel any better. Amber Drake stood beside the leader of their party and wrung more water out of a braid of hair. He waited for the fellow to say something enlightening. Fog wreathed around them both and shrouded everything more than a few paces away in impenetrable whiteness. I wish I knew what was going on here, Regan muttered, staring at the pair of soggy decoys wedged up in the fork of a tree. There's no trail from the camp, which looks as if the Silvers were trying to conceal their back trail, but there isn't any sign of anything hunting them either. And now we find this. The ground beneath the tree was torn up, as was the bark of the lower trunk, but there was no blood. There was a deadfall rigged of wood that had been tripped, but there was no sign that anything had been caught in it. They might have passed the site by, thinking that it was just a place where some large forest creature had been marking his territory. Except that there was a human-shaped decoy and a griffin-shaped decoy wedged high in a tree. That isn't very enlightening. They might have run into some sort of large predator, Drake pointed out. Just because we don't see any sign of a hunter, that doesn't mean they weren't being trailed. That would account for why they tried not to leave a trail. Maybe that's even the reason why they left their camp in the first place. This was the first sign of the children that any of them had come across in their trek toward the river. Amber Drake took it as a good omen. It certainly showed that the duo had gotten this far, so their own party was certainly on the right track. And it showed that they were in good enough health to rig something like this. Maybe. But why decoys? Regan paced carefully around the trunk of the tree, examining it on all sides. Most forest predators hunt with their noses, and even in this rain the trail from here to wherever they did spend the night would be fresh enough to follow. I wonder what we can learn from this. I don't know. I'm not a hunter, Amber Drake admitted, and let it go at that. Scan didn't, however. Whatever tore this place up is an animal, or at least it doesn't use weapons or tools, he pointed out. It might just be that the... that Blade and Tad wandered into its territory and they built the decoys to keep it occupied while they went on their way. Maybe, Regan shook his head. Whatever it was, I don't recognize the marks, but that doesn't surprise me. I haven't recognized much in this benighted forest since we got into it, and I'm beginning to wonder how anything survives here without gills. With that he shrugged, heading off into the forest in the direction of the river. Amber Drake followed him, but Scan lingered a moment before hurrying to catch up lest he get left behind and lost in the fog. I don't like it, he muttered fretfully as he reached Drake's side. I just don't like it. It didn't look right back there, but I can't put my finger on why. I don't know enough about hunting animals to be of any help, Drake replied bluntly. He kept telling himself that the children were, must be, still fine. 
that no matter how impressive the signs these unknown creatures had left were, the children had obviously escaped their jaws. All I know is that whatever made those marks must be the size of a horse, and if I were being chased by something that size, I probably wouldn't be on the ground at night. Maybe they put those decoys up one tree and then climbed over to another to spend the night, unless, of course, they're too hurt to climb trees. But in that case, how did the decoys get up in one? Illusion, Scan said suddenly, his head coming up with a jerk. That's it. There's no illusion and no traces of one on those decoys. Tad's not a powerful mage, but he's good enough to cast an illusion, and if I were building a decoy, I'd want to make it look as much like me as possible. So why didn't he put an illusion on it? Because he couldn't, Drake said flatly. If mage energy got sucked out of the basket and everything else, it could have gotten sucked out of him, and it might not have built up enough yet for him to do anything. Oh. Scam was taken a bit aback, but finally nodded his acceptance of Drake's explanation. Amber Drake was just as glad, because he could think of another. Tad can't work a simple magic like an illusion, because he's hurt too badly. On the other hand, those decoys were soggy enough to have been here for a couple of days, so that meant that the children made fairly good progress for two people trying to hide their back trail, so that in turn meant that they couldn't have been hurt too badly, didn't it? He also didn't want to think about how having mage energy drained from him might affect Tad in other, more subtle ways. Would it be like a slowly draining wound? Would it affect his ability to work magic at all? What if he simply was no longer a mage anymore? Griffins were inherently magical for good reasons, and Eartha would not have designed them so otherwise. Although the Mage of Silence had made many mistakes, the Griffins were considered his masterpieces. Magic collected in their bodies with every breath and with every stroke of the wings. It stabilised their life systems, cleaned their organs, helped them fly. Amberdrake had never heard of what would happen if a griffin were deprived of mage energy completely for an extended amount of time. Would it be like fatigue poisoning, or gout, or something even more insidious, like a mental imbalance? The rescue party was moving along in a tightly bunched group to keep from getting separated in the mist. We're on the right track, at least. The children certainly came this way, Amberdrake reminded himself. They're moving right along, thinking, planning. If they're in trouble, the best place for them is the river. There's food there that's easy to catch, and maybe caves in the cliffs. They're doing all the right things, especially if they're having to deal with large predators. Maybe this was why the rescuers hadn't found much in the way of large game. They'd tried to send on their findings by Tellison, so that the other two parties out searching knew to turn back to the river. The mage Felix thought he'd gotten everything through clearly, but without local mage energy to draw on, he couldn't be certain that all the details had made it over. Still, whether the children went north or south when they encountered the river, someone should run into them now. Their own party was going to try to the north, mostly because they did know for certain that Ikalas would be coming up from below them, also heading north. This damned fog. It makes me more nervous than the rain. If, when, we all get out of this, I'm never leaving the city again, I swear it. Not unless it's to visit another city. So far as I'm concerned, you can take the wilderness experience and bury it in a hole. He'd never forgotten the hardships of the trek to White Griffin, and he'd been all too well aware of what this mission would involve. He thought he'd been prepared for it. Except for one thing. I'd forgotten that now I'm not as limber as I used to be for this sort of thing. Judith and Aubrey certainly didn't volunteer to traipse through the woods, and now I see why. They probably think I'm a fool, forcing myself to go along on this rescue, trying to do a young man's job. Maybe letting me go was Judith's way of getting revenge upon me for threatening her. But Blade wasn't Judith's daughter, nor was Tad Aubrey's son. No, I'd rather be out here. At least I know that I'm doing something this way. Janelle and Winterheart must feel the same, or they wouldn't have insisted on coming either. But the fog was doing more than just getting on his nerves. He kept thinking that he was seeing shadows flitting alongside them, out there. He kept feeling eyes on him and getting glimpses of skulking shapes out of the corner of his eye. It was all nonsense, of course, and just his nerves getting the better of him, but... Drake, Scan whispered carefully. We're being paced. I don't know by what, but there's something out there. I can taste it in the fog, and I've seen a couple of shadows moving. You're sure... That was Regan, who had signalled for a halt, and dropped back when he heard Scan whispering. Byrne thought he might be seeing something, too. 
Then count me as three, because I saw large shadows moving out there and behind us, Drake said firmly. Could it be whatever tore up the ground back there? If it is, I don't want to go into attacking us in this fog, Regan replied, though I doubt it will, as long as we look confident. Most big hunters won't mess with the group, Byrne confirmed, nodding. They're like single prey, not a pack. Drake must have looked sceptical, because Regan thumped him on the back in what was probably supposed to be an expression of hearty reassurance. It drove the breath out of him and staggered him a pace. There's too many of us for it to want to contend with, Regan pointed out with confidence. And we aren't hurt. I don't care if it paces us, as long as it doesn't come after us, and it won't. I'm sure of it. Amber Drake got his breath again, and shrugged. You're the leader, he said, keeping his uncertainty to himself. Regan grinned as if to say, That's right, I am, but wisely kept his response to a grin and waved them on again. Drake continued to feel the eyes on his back, and kept thinking about beings the size of a horse with talons to match, the kinds of claws that had torn up the earth to the depth of his hand. Would a party of seven humans and one griffin look all that formidable to something like that? And what if there was more than one of those things out there? The way the ground had been dug up certainly suggested that there were several. You won't like this, Scan Griffin whispered, which was as subtle and quiet as a human's normal speaking voice. The Griffin glanced from side to side apprehensively. Drake, I think we've been surrounded. All the muscles in Amber Drake's neck went tight, and he shivered reflexively. He no longer trusted Regan's self-confidence in the least. At just that moment, Regan signalled another halt, and Byrne took him aside to whisper something into his ear. The leader looked straight at Scan. Byrne says we're surrounded. Are we? I think so, Scan said flatly. And I don't think whatever is out there is just curious. I also don't think it's going to let us get much farther without a fight. Regan's face darkened, as if Scan had challenged him. But he turned his eyes to the shrouding fog before replying. The general always says the best defense is a good offense, he replied in a growl. But there's no point in lobbing arrows against things we can't see. We'll lose ammunition without impressing them. The rains are going to begin as soon as the fog lifts, sir, Byrne pointed out. We still won't be able to see what's out there, and you can't shoot with a wet bowstring. Regan leveled his gaze on Felix next. Is there something you can do to find out what's following us? Maybe scare it away? I don't want to waste time better spent looking for Silverblade and Tadrath. The maid shrugged. Maybe, I can try. The best thing would be to try to stun one so that we can see what it looks like. I don't have to see something to stun it, I just have to know in general where it is. The leader spread his hands, indicating his full permission. You're the mage. Try it. See what happens. Amber Drake opened his mouth to object, but closed it again. After all, what did he know? Nothing about hunting, predators, or being stalked. If their stalkers were only curious, after all, stunning one wouldn't hurt them. If they were thinking about making a meal of the rescuers, well, having one of their lot fall over without a mark on him should make them back off for a while. At least it certainly seemed to him that it should work out that way, and by the time the hunters regained their courage, the rescue party would probably be long gone. Scan opened his beak and Amber Drake thought he was going to object as well, but it was too late. Felix had already spotted something, or thought he had, and had unleashed the spell. The result was not what any of them had expected. A dark shadow in the fog glowed suddenly. Amber Drake got an odd, unsettling feeling in the pit of his stomach, and Felix and Scan cursed together with heartfelt fluency. What? Regan snapped, looking from one to the other. What? It ate my spell, Felix began, but Scan interrupted him, waving the teleson he'd been carrying around his neck. It ate the teleson, the griffin roared. Damn! Whatever's out there is what pulled Blade and Tad down, and you just fed it everything it wanted! Scan was just glad that they had alerted the other parties that they had finally found signs of the missing children, before the Tellison became a pretty piece of junk. By the time they camped that night, it was evident that not only had the creatures out there eaten the Tellison, or rather drained away all of its mage energy, but they had eaten the energy from every other magical device the party had. Why they'd waited so long to do so was a matter of conjecture at this point. Maybe they'd been screwing up their courage to do so. Maybe they had just been biding their time until they had a certain number of their lot in place. 
Maybe the things were staying in hiding until something was thrown at them, as a form of cover. It wasn't my fault, Felix kept protesting. How was I going to know? He couldn't have known that some bizarre animals were the cause of the trouble, of course, but since they had known there was something out here that ate magic, it seemed a scan that lobbing spells around indiscriminately was obviously a bad idea. He'd been about to say just that when Felix had lobbed the first one. Well, what the search party had to deal with now were the results. In the short term, that meant the tents had to be put up by hand, and using freshly cut poles and ropes. Fires had to be started with the old-fashioned fire striker, and any number of other problems, both inconvenient and possibly hazardous, suddenly arose to confront them. In the long term, having gotten a taste, the strange and possibly hostile creatures that had stalked them through the fog and rain might now be looking for a meal. The tents were keeping the rain out, but were not precisely dry any more. They weren't keeping bugs out either. Scan wondered how long it would take until it occurred to Regan that the waterproofing and bug protections on their rations might also have been magical. Serve him right if he had to eat soggy, weevil-ridden ration bread. The two tents shared a canvas porch. It lacked a canvas floor and one wall, but it gave protection to their fire. They gathered in the two tents on either side of the fire, with the flaps tied back. Regan called them for a conference as the light began to dim in the forest outside. Rain drummed down on the canvas, but Regan had pitched his voice to carry over it. We're doing fine, Regan decreed as they sat, crowded into the two tents meant for a total of four, not eight. At least this way, they all had space to get out of the wet, even if it was not completely dry beneath the canvas. We have nothing to worry about. Canvas still keeps out rain, wood still burns, and we still have the North Needle, which is, thank the gods, not magical. We've found the river, and it's only a matter of time before we either run into the missing silvers, or one of the other parties does. If they do, they'll try and notify us, realise what happened, when they don't get our Tellison, and come fetch us. If we find them first, we'll just backtrack along the river until we meet one of the other parties, then get back to the base camp. Not a problem. Scan was hardly in agreement with that sentiment, but Regan was the leader, and it was poor form to undermine confidence in your leader when it was most needed by others. This is not a wartime situation, and now we know that the magic stealers are just some kind of strange wild animal, not an enemy force. If we're just careful, we should get out of this intact and with the children. At least, that was what he was trying to tell himself. For tonight, I want a double watch set. Four and four. Split the night, a mage in each of the two watches. Regan looked around for volunteers for the first watch, and got his four without Scan or Drake needing to put up a hand. Scan did not intend to volunteer, but Felix seemed so eager to make up for the mistake that cost them all their magic, that it looked as if the younger mage had beaten the griffin to volunteering. Scan wondered what the young man thought he was volunteering for. He was hardly a fighter, and the idea of throwing magic at something that ate magic did not appeal to the griffin. I'm not lobbing a single spell around until we lose these menaces, he resolved. If these things eat magic, it stands to reason that magic makes them stronger, and the stronger they are, the more likely they are to attack us physically. Well, Felix could use a bow at least, even if he didn't possess a griffin's natural weaponry. He might do all right at that, provided he thinks before he acts. He wanted to take Felix aside and caution him, but an earlier attempt had not been very successful. Felix clearly thought that Scam was overreacting to the situation. One of the biggest problems with the younger mages, youngsters who had come along after the cataclysm, was that they thought magic could fix everything. They had yet to learn that magic was nothing more than another tool, and one that you could do without if you had to. Maybe things wouldn't be as convenient without it, but so what? Snowstar ought to force them to spend a year not using magic. Regan nodded with satisfaction at his volunteers. Right. Close up the watch right around the camp. There's no point in guarding a big perimeter tonight. If you get a clear shot, take it. Maybe if we make things unpleasant enough for whatever it is out there, it'll get discouraged and leave us alone. And maybe you'll provoke them into an attack. Scan reminded himself that he was not the leader, and kept his beak clamped tightly shut on his own objections. But he resolved to sleep with himself between Drake and the tent wall, and to do so lightly. Somehow, he managed to invoke most of the old battle reflexes, get himself charged up to the point where nerves would do instead of sleep, and laid himself warily down to rest with one eye and ear open. In his opinion, Regan was taking all this far too casually, and was far too certain that they were only dealing with a peculiar form of wild animal. 
and he was so smug about the fact that he had brought non-magical backups to virtually every magical piece of equipment except the Tellison, that Scan wanted to smack him into good sense again. Bringing backups isn't the point, he seethed, as he positioned himself to best protect Drake in an attack. The fact that there is something out there that can eat magic and is clearly hostile, that's the point. What good are our backups going to do if these things decide they want more than just a taste of us from a distance? The rains slowed, then stopped. The fire died, leaving them with nothing but glowing coals for a source of light. Just as the camp quieted down for the night, the wild animals proved that they were not intimidated by a party of eight. Scan came awake all at once, with the sound of someone falling to the ground, followed by cursing and a bowstring snapping practically in his ear. But it wasn't Felix taking the shot. The mage was lying on the ground, just outside the canvas wall near a scan, gasping for breath. The other three humans not on watch scrambled up, but Scan was already on his feet, ready for trouble. A moment later, Regan hauled the half-conscious mage into the tent. What happened? Scan asked harshly, as the other two fighters scrambled outside, leaving himself, Regan and Drake alone with the disabled mage. Amber Drake went to the young mage's side immediately and began examining him. The leader shook his head. I don't know, the young man admitted, looking pale and confused in the light from the single lamp that Drake had lit. He saw something out there, and I think he was going to work some magic on it. He muttered something about his shields, and then he just fell over. I took a shot at something moving, but I don't think I hit it. He's been drained, Amber Drake said flatly, looking up, with his hand still on Felix's forehead. I saw this once or twice in the war, when majors overextended themselves. I remember that. It was on the orders of an incompetent commander. The only difference is that this time... Felix didn't overextend himself. He was drained to nothing by means of the spell he cast, Drake continued. My guess is that those creatures out there were able to use his previous magic to get into his shield castings, and then just pulled everything he had out of him, the way they pulled the mage energy out of the Teleson, and probably Tadrith and Silverblade's basket as well. Stupid son of... Regan bit off what he was going to say. Is he going to be all right? Maybe. Probably, as long as he doesn't give whatever it is out there another chance to drain him. Drake looked angry and a little disgusted, and Scan didn't blame him. I'll do what I can for him, but you should be aware that it isn't much. Lady Cinnabar herself couldn't do much for something like this. What he needs is rest, rest and more rest. We're going to have to carry him for the next few days. He probably won't even regain consciousness until tomorrow, and his head will hurt worse than it ever has in his life for several days. Well, we'll go short one this shift, Regan shook his head again. Stupid. He glanced at Scan, who drew himself up with dignity. I know better than to try anything magical, he retorted to the unspoken rebuke. I'll use a more direct method of defending this camp, if I have to use anything. Stupid fool thought that if he cast shields he'd be safe against this, Scan fumed. Never bothered to remember that magical shields are themselves magical, did he? And since shields are spun out from your own power, they're traceable directly back into your own mage energies. He probably didn't think it was necessary to cast anything more complicated, and figured his shields would block anything coming in. The result had clearly been immediate, and had certainly been predictable. He pulled Drake back into the tent they had been trying to sleep in. We'll stay here, he told Amber Drake. Leave him in the other tent with Regan. With just one man to watch him? Amber Drake asked. Scan shook his head. Doesn't matter he replied. There's nothing you can do for him, and if something comes charging in here, we're going to have more important things to think about than defending an unconscious mage. There it was. Hard, cruel war truths. This was a war, whether or not Regan realised it yet. Evidently Drake did, he grimaced, but didn't protest any further. He remembered. He knew that the two of them must make the priority that of finding the children, and he knew all about cutting losses which was just as well, because a few moments later, the second attack came. There was no warning. They hadn't even blown out the lantern or tried to lie down again. The rain must have covered any sounds of approach, for there certainly was nothing outside the tent walls to indicate anything was wrong. All that Scan knew was that Burns shouted, then screamed, and something dark came ripping through the canvas of the tent, knocking over the lantern in the process, plunging them into darkness until the spilled oil flared up. 
He knocked Drake to the ground and stood over him, slashing at whatever came near in the darkness. He ignored anything outside the tent to the point where it simply didn't exist for him, concentrating fiercely on the tiny currents of air, sounds, movement, and what little he could see reflecting from the burning spilled oil. His talons connected several times with something that felt like snakeskin, tearing through it to the flesh beneath, and he clenched any time he was able to, so that he might rend away a chunk of meat. But his opponents uttered nothing more than a hiss, and they dashed away through the double rents in the tent canvas, as if his fierce opposition surprised them. The fight couldn't have lasted very long, for not only was he not tired, he hadn't even warmed up to full fighting speed when the attacks ceased and the attackers vanished, silent shadows sliding between the raindrops. He stood over Drake a while longer. The Kestrachan had the good sense to stay put and not move the entire time. When Amadrake Drake finally moved, it was to pat the flame out with the edge of a bedroll and then right to the lantern. Are they gone? came the voice from between his feet. I think so, Scan replied, shaking his head to refocus himself. Only then did he hear the moans of wounded and the sound of Burn calling his name. We're here, Drake answered for him as he relit the lantern with a smouldering corner of the bedroll. We're all right, I think. That's more than the rest of us can say, the scout replied grimly, wheezing and coughing. Can you get out here and help me? If I let go of this rag around my leg, I'm going to bleed myself out. Drake swore, scrambled for the medical kit in the darkness, and pushed through the ruined tent wall. Scan followed slowly. When the lantern had been relit so that Drake could see to treat wounds, and everyone had been accounted for, they discovered that Regan and Felix had been killed by more of the things. They had probably died instantly, or nearly so. Amber Drake reached for the bodies, and could only locate so many pieces. At the very least, they got the mercy of a quick death. There wasn't much left of them, Blood was spattered everywhere, and it was difficult to tell what part belonged to whom. He left the tent quickly, reminded all too forcefully of some of Adainleth's victims. And of Ma'ar's. I'm supposed to be hardened to this sort of thing, but maybe I've just seen too much death, too much suffering. Maybe I'm not as tough as I thought I was, or wish I could be, even after all this time. It was one thing to think about cutting losses, another thing to lose people like this. We were caught unprepared, despite my hoped-for lessons of experience. Amadrake remained for a few moments longer, and when he came out, he surprised Scan by the thoughtful look of concentration he wore. Finally, as the other men bundled the two bodies hastily in the remains of the tent, he drew Scan aside. Are these things animals, or not? he asked. Scan blinked. They certainly fought like it, he replied cautiously. Extremely efficient predators. They didn't have weapons, just talons, and teeth, and... and speed. I don't think I've ever seen anything that fast since the last Makar died. Fierce predators. No wonder we haven't seen much game, and all of it's small. They must have emptied out the forest around here, of ground-based game at least. He shook his head. We should have figured that out, and assumed they'd attack us for food. They must be half mad with hunger by now. They can't live long on rabbits, snakes, and bugs, not as big as they are. Drake nodded, as if he had expected Scan to say that. In that case, tell me this, why didn't they drag their prey off with them to eat? Why didn't they try and kill more of us? Scan opened his beak to reply, and shut it with a click. Why didn't they, if they're just big hunters with an incidental ability to eat mage energy? Maybe we don't taste good, he suggested lamely. Maybe, but that hasn't stopped lions from becoming man-eaters when they're famished. Charlemagne showed us that, remember? Amber Drake chewed on his lower lip a moment. I have a feeling that these things are planning something, and that they don't intend to let us get away. Scan. They're a lot worse than they seem. They seem bad enough already to me, Scan grumbled. But I see your point. He didn't have time to think much more about it, however, for Byrne, as acting leader, decreed that there would be no more rest that night. They spent the rest of the dark hours in the open, sitting in a circle, with their backs together, facing the forest with weapons in hand. It was a long, cold, and terrifying night. Every time a drop of water fell from a leaf, someone started. Every time a shadow seemed to move, they all got ready to defend their lives. Scan had never spent a night as frightening as this one, not even during the war, and he prayed no one else would ever have to either. 
Stelvi Pass had been a summer day compared to this unending, wet, cold waiting. He didn't know how Amber Drake was managing to bear up. It was bad enough to endure this knowing that he could, if there was no other choice, escape by flying into the treetops. Even in a fight, he could defend himself against fairly stiff odds. But Drake couldn't escape, and he wasn't a fighter, and in his place, Scan knew he'd have been babbling with fear. As soon as there was any light at all beneath the trees, Byrne ordered them to move out, down to the river that they had heard all night long. The flood-swollen river, which roared at their feet, with nothing on the other side but a rocky cliff face and a scrap of path. You two aren't fighters, so you get across the river and hold it for us so we can cross, he ordered Drake and Scan. Scan took one look at the swollen, raging waters and seriously considered mutiny. But Amber Drake just picked up a coil of rope from the wreckage of the camp and gestured to him to follow down to the rocks at the edge. There he rigged a harness of rope for himself, while Byrne and the rest stood nervously with their backs to the water, facing the forest, bows and swords ready. Soon enough the fog would rise, and when the shadow creatures came back, the besieged rescuers wouldn't be able to see them until it was far too late. Drake, the expert in ropes and knots, moved far more quickly than Scam would have thought possible under the circumstances. His fingers fairly flew as he put together a harness it would be impossible to get out of without undoing at least half of the knots. It must have seemed to the four injured fighters that he was taking a ridiculous amount of time, however. He was even making sure that it would fit over his pack, the precious pack that had what was left of their medical kit, the oil and the oil lamp. Hurry up! Byrne shouted, his voice pitched higher with strain and nerves. Drake ignored them and turned to Scan. You can't carry me over, but you can tow me through the water, he pointed out. There's no way I'm going to slip out of this. He fastened the loose end of the rope to a tree at the water's edge, without elaborating anything, but his plan was obvious to Scan. The harness was rigged so that Drake could swim freely, but could also be towed along easily, which is what he meant Scan to do, flying above the river. Once he got Drake to the other side, the Kestra Chern could fasten his rope to a boulder or spike of rock, and the others could plunge in and drag themselves across. Providing, of course, there weren't more of those things on the other side, waiting somewhere. If that last thought occurred to Amber Drake, he didn't hesitate for a second. Once he had the end of the rope tied off, he plunged immediately into the river, almost before Scan had a hold of the end fastened to his harness. Caught off balance for a moment, Scan held on against the tug of the current, then launched himself into the air. Amber Drake sputtered and submerged once, then steadied. He called out, It's drier in here than in the forest! Once there, he was utterly grateful that Drake was a good swimmer, and he allowed himself a brief, tension-relieving smile at Amber Drake's quip. His friend was able to keep his own head above water, so that Scan's only task was to pull him onward. Only? This is like playing tug-of-war against five teams of draft horses. It was obvious within a few moments that this was going to be a great deal more difficult than it looked. They weren't even a single length from the shore, and Scan wanted to quit. The griffin's wings beat laboriously, the muscles in his back and chest burning with pain, as he pulled against the current and the weight of Drake's body. Below him Amber Drake laboured against the current trying to pull him under, and occasionally lost the battle. But he had honed his swimming ability in the powerful surf below White Griffin. Between his own strength and Scan's, his head always popped back above the surface again, long enough for him to get another lung full of air. Ten heartbeats later, they were out of time. Hurry! Byrne shouted again, his voice spiralling upward in fear. They're coming! Scan ignored him as best he could, concentrating every fibre on getting a little more strength out of his wings. Drake was not doing well down there. The treacherous currents kept pulling him under, and each time he rose to the surface it took a little longer. They were about halfway across when the sounds of battle erupted behind them, short screams and cries that echoed above the roaring river. He ignored those too as best he could. His world narrowed to the face of his friend in the water below, the rope in his front talons, the pain of his labouring body and the farther shore. His lungs were on fire, his forelimbs ached with all the tortures of the damned from the strain of holding Drake and pulling him onward. His vision fogged with red, as it had only a few times in the past, when he had driven himself past his limits. The bank was only a few lengths away, but he was out of energy, running out of strength, and just about out of endurance. He wasn't going to make it. He could drop the rope and save himself, or they would both be dragged under. No, he was not going to surrender with the goal so close. Come on, Griffin. If he can do this, so can you. 
You're a team, remember? He's counting on you not to let him drown. Think of what Winterheart would do to you if you did. Think of what Gaston would do. Amber Drake has been with you all your life, Griffin. All your life. He's had his hands in your guts and your blood in his hair, putting you back together from pieces. He didn't leave you then. He wouldn't leave you. From somewhere came another burst of strength, and with a cry that was half a scream of defiance and half a moan of agony, he drove himself at the bank. He made it by mere talon lengths, dropping down on it with all the grace of a shot duck, and landing half on the bank, half in the water. With a groan, he grabbed the rope in his beak and dragged himself and Drake, talon over talon, onto the bank and safety. He wanted to just lie there, panting, but there were still four more people on the other side. Somehow he pulled himself up to a standing position on shaking legs, just as Drake got to his hands and knees, and both of them turned toward the far bank at the same time. All they saw was torn foliage, the slashed end of the rope hanging off the tree Drake had tied it to, splashes of red that weren't likely flowers, and the empty shore. They watched, panting and slumping down against each other until the fog closed in, leaving them staring at blank whiteness. They were alone. It could not be much longer before whatever it was that had attacked them found a way to cross, unless it took a long time to eat. For a moment, he felt stricken, numb, frozen with shock. But he had been in too many fights and lost too many comrades for this to paralyze him now. Mourn later. Find safety now. Drake looked at him from beneath a mat of hair that had become a tangled, dripping mess, his clothing half torn from his body by the fight of last night, and a strange look of hope in his eyes. For one stark moment, Scam was afraid that he'd gone mad. Blade, he began hoarsely, then coughed, huge, racking coughs that brought up half a lungful of river water. Scan balled his talons into fists and pounded his back until he stopped coughing and waved Scan off. Blade! He began again, his voice a ruin. He looked up and pointed north along the riverbank. She's that way. I can feel her. I swear it, Scan. With one accord, they dragged themselves to their feet and stumbled northward over the slippery rocks and wet clay of the bank below the cliff face. North, where their children must be. Tad inspected the last of the traps, with no real hope that he would find anything at this one that differed from all the rest. The first wire said they had killed had been the last. None of the traps worked a second time. In fact, the wire sir seemed to take a fiendish delight in triggering the damned things and leaving them empty. So far they had not dared the last one, another rockfall that he or Blade could trigger from inside the cave. He suspected, though, that it was only a matter of time before they did. On the other hand, they would not be able to disarm it without triggering it so perhaps they were all even. As he had expected, this snare lay empty too. He decided that the rope could be better used elsewhere, and salvaged it. It certainly would have been nice if this one had worked, though. His nerves were wearing thin, and he was afraid that the wiresome might be able to drain mage energy from him constantly now, since they were so close. He didn't dare try shielding against them. Shields were magical too, and they could surely be eaten like anything else magical. When they'd first found the cave, he had thought that the noise of the river and the waterfall would cover the sounds anything approaching made, but over the past few days he had discovered to his surprise that he'd been wrong. To a limited extent, he had actually gotten used to the steady roaring, and was able to pick out other noises beyond it. But the very last sound he had been expecting was the noise of someone, a two-legged someone, scrambling over the rocks at a speed designed to break his neck, and panting. Especially not coming toward him, those were not wiser sounds either, not unless the wiser had acquired a pair of hunting boots and put them on. He had barely time to register and recognise the sounds before the makers of the noise burst through the fog right in his face. He hadn't heard the second one, because he had been flying and his wing beats had not carried over the sound of the falls. Tadrith looked up to find his vision filled with the fierce, glorious silhouette of the black griffin. Father! he exclaimed, in mingled relief and shock. Amber Drake! No time! Scandranan panted as Amber Drake scrabbled right past him without pausing. Run! We're being chased! No need to ask what was chasing them. 
Scan landed heavily, then turned to stand at bay to guard Amber Drake's retreat. Tad leaped up beside him, despite his handicap. With two griffins guarding the narrow trail, there wasn't a chance in the world that the wiser would get past. But they certainly tried. The fog was as thick as curdled milk, and the wires are nothing more than shadows and slashing claws and fangs reaching for them through the curtain. But they couldn't get more than two of their number up to face Scan and Tad at any one time, and without the whole pack able to attack together, their tactics were limited. They were fast, but Tad and Scan were retreating, step by careful step, and that generally got them out of range before a talon or a bite connected. Step by step, and watch it. Slip and you end up under those claws. Thank Eartha for giving us four legs. They retreated all the way to the shelf of rock in front of the cave, and that was where their own reinforcements stepped in. Duck! came the familiar order, and this time when he and his father dropped to the ground, not only did rocks hurl over their heads, but a pair of daggers hummed past Tad's ear like angry wasps. They both connected, too, and one was fatal. The wire nearest the water got it in the throat, made a gurgle, and fell over to be swept away by the rushing torrent. The second was lucky. He was only hit in the shoulder, but gave the familiar hiss yelp and vanished into the fog. Scan and Tad took advantage of the respite to turn their backs in turn and scramble into the cave itself. There they turned again, prepared for another onslaught, but the wire said evidently had enough for one day. Tad sat down right where he was, breathing heavily, heart pounding. His father was less graceful and more tired than that, and dropped down onto the sand as if he'd been shot himself, panting with his beak wide open. I always knew those throwing knives were going to come in handy some day, Amber Drake observed. He looked nothing like the Amber Drake that Tad had known all his life. His long hair was a draggling, tangled, water-soaked mess, his clothing stained, torn, muddy, and also sodden. He wore a pack that was just as much of a mess, at least externally. At his waist was a belt holding one long knife, a pouch, and an odd sheath that held many smaller, flat knives, exactly of the kind that had just whizzed over Tad's head. Yes, but you had to learn how to throw them first, Scan replied, panting. You and your bargains. They were a bargain, Amber Drake said indignantly. A dozen of them for the price of that one single fighting knife that you wanted me to get. But you knew how to use... The fighting knife? Blade brought her father and Scan a skin of water each, and they drank thirstily. She looked from one to the other of them, and carefully assessed their condition. I don't think I'm going to ask where the rest of your group is, she said quietly. I'm pretty certain I already know. A tiny oil lamp cast warm light down on Amber Drake and his patient. Blade sat at her father's feet while he examined her shoulder, as Scan and Tad kept watch at the mouth of the cave. You did a fine job on Tadrith's wing, Amber Drake murmured. I only wish he had done as good a job on your shoulder blade. Well, that certainly explained why it wouldn't stop hurting. You're not going to have to re-break it, are you? She asked, trying not to wince. He patted her unhurt shoulder comfortingly, and it was amazing just how good that simple gesture felt. Not hardly, since it was never set in the first place. Immobilized, yes, but not set. I'm astonished that you've managed as much as you have. He placed the tips of his fingers delicately over the offending bone. It's possible that it was only cracked at first and not broken, and that somewhere along the line you simply completed the break. Hold very still for a moment, and this will hurt. She tried not to brace herself, since that would only make things worse. She felt his fingers tighten, sensed a snap, and literally saw stars for a moment it hurt so much. When she could see again, she was still sitting upright, and he still had his hands on her shoulders, so she must have managed not to move. She sagged gratefully against the rock he was sitting on, and wiped tears from her eyes weakly. Now, stay still a moment more, he urged. I haven't done this for a long time, and I'm rather out of practice. She obeyed in a moment later, felt the area above the break warming. The pain there vanished, all but a faint throbbing in time with her pulse. I had forgotten he still has some healing ability. Not enough that he ever acts as a healer any more, but enough that he could in the war. In fact, he was first sent by his family off to train as a healer, but his empathic senses got in the way. In the war he was supposed to have been very good, even on griffins. Amber Drake finally lifted his hands from her shoulder and sighed. I'm sorry, dear heart. I can't do as much as I'd like. It was far more than she'd had any hope of before they arrived. 
You did a great deal, Father. Believe me, I hope you saved plenty of yourself for Tad, she said. Especially since you did specialize in griffin trauma during the war. I did, he replied as she twisted around to look up at him. He combed his hair out of his eyes with one hand and grimaced. I'll keep working on you two as I recuperate too. But I never was as competent at healing as I'd like, and accelerating bone growth. Well, it's hard, and I never did learn to do it well. Maybe if I'd gotten the right training when I was younger, then you'd have been a healer. Lady Cinnabar would have been your lady and apprentice instead of Tamsin's, and I wouldn't be here, she interrupted. I love you just the way you are, father. I wouldn't change a thing. And suddenly she realized that she meant exactly that, probably for the first time since she had been a small child. She knew that he had needed to extend his empathic sense in order to heal, and he still hadn't barricaded himself. He felt that, and his eyes filled with tears. He wanted to hear that from me as much as I wanted his approval, she thought with astonishment. How could I have been so blind all this time, thinking only the child could want approval from the parent? How stupid of me. The parent wants approval from the child just as much. Blade, he said. She didn't let him finish. She reached up for him as he reached down for her, and they held each other while his tears fell on her cheeks and mingled with hers. It was he who pulled away first, not she rubbing his nose inelegantly on the back of his hand as he sniffed, and managing a weak smile for her. Well, <laughs> aren't we a pair of sentimental idiots, he began. No, you're a pair of sensible idiots, if that isn't contradictory, Scandranan interrupted. You two are overdue for that if you ask me, and if you don't ask me, I'll tell you anyway, and I'm right, as usual. Drake, what can she do now, if anything? I've strengthened and knitted the bone a bit, Amber Drake replied looking at her, although he answered Scan, and I've done something about the pain. I wouldn't engage in hand-to-hand, -hand, but you can certainly throw a spear, use a sling, or do some very limited sword play. No shields, sorry, it won't take that kind of strain. We don't have any shields with us, so that hardly matters, she replied dryly. Nor bows, either. We had to concentrate on bringing things we could use. Well, I know how to make a throwing stick and the spears to go with it. If you know how to use one, Amber Drake admitted, that should increase your range. There ought to be some wood in here straight enough for spears. He knows how to make a weapon. She throttled down a surprise and just nodded. Yes to both. Now let me go replace Tad at the front, and you can work your will on him. She almost said magic, but stopped herself just in time. Since the Wyasa hadn't come calling when her father began his healing, evidently they did not eat healing energy. Which was just as well, under the circumstances. Perhaps it was too localized or too finely tuned to be sucked in from afar. She stood up, hefted a spear in both hands, marveling at her new freedom from pain, and smiled with grim pleasure at the feel of a good weapon. Tad retreated to the back of the cave and she took her place beside his father. So, what exactly are those nightmares? Scan asked. Have you any idea? She stared out into the rain. The rain had begun early, which meant that the fog had lifted early. That was to their advantage. With four enemies in the cave, she didn't think that the Wyasa would venture an attack in broad daylight. Tad thinks they're some kind of Wyasa, maybe changed by the mage storms, she told him. They're about the size of a horse and they're black, and I suppose you already know that they eat magic. Only too well, Scan groaned. Well, to counter that advantage, they seem to have lost their poison fangs and claws, she said. I don't think they're going to try entrancing us again after the first time, but if they start weaving in and around each other, they can hypnotize you if you aren't careful. The wires I used to hunt were better at it than that, Scan observed, watching the bushes across the river tremble. So they've lost a couple of attributes and gained one. Could be worse. One touch of those claws and you were in poor shape, and that was with the hound-sized ones. A horse-sized one would probably kill you just by scratching you lightly. I suppose that counts as good news then, she sighed. I think this is a pack of youngsters led by one older female, probably their mother. We don't know how many there are. Two less than when they started, though. I don't know if you saw it, but father got one. Tad got one a couple of days ago with a rock fall. The problem is, no trap works twice on them. Why, sir, the size of a horse, Scan muttered and shook his head. Terrible. I'd rather have Makar. I wonder what other pleasant surprises the mage storms left out here for us to find. She shrugged. Right now this is the only one that matters. It's pretty obvious that the things breed and breed true. So if we don't get rid of them, 
One of these days they'll come looking for more magic meals closer to our home. She turned her gaze on Scandranum for a moment. And what did happen to your party other than what I can guess? Scandranum told her, as tersely as she could have wished. She hadn't known any of the Silvers well, except Byrne, who'd been a tracking teacher. But it struck her that they had all acted with enormous stupidity and arrogance. Was it only because when they didn't meet with any immediate trouble that they assumed there wasn't anything to worry about? Between you and me, my dear, Scandranon said in an undertone, I'm afraid the late Regan was an idiot. I suspect that he assumed that since you were a green graduate, probably hurt and female to boot, you got into difficulties with what to him would have been minor opponents. He was wary at first, but when no armies and no renegade majors appeared, he started acting as if this was a training exercise. She tried not to think too uncharitably of the dead silver. Well, we don't have much experience, and it would be reasonable to think that we might have panicked and overreacted, she said judiciously. Still, I'd have thumped that Felix over the head and tied him up once I found the wreck and knew there was something that ate magic about. Why attract attention to yourself? Good question, Scan replied. I wish now I'd done just that. His mournful expression filled in the rest. She could read his thoughts in his eyes. Or was that her empathic sense operating? If I had, they might still be alive. I should have pulled rank on them. She turned her attention back to the outside, for she felt distinctly uneasy having the Black Griffin confess weakness, even tacitly, to her. And yet she felt oddly proud. He would not have let her see that if he were not treating her as an adult and an equal. Well, what it all comes down to is this, she said grimly. No one is going to get us out of this except ourselves. We have no way to warn anyone, and what happened to you is entirely likely to happen to them, unless they're smarter than Regan was. Oh, well, that goes without saying. The closest team to us is led by Ikala, Scan said, rather slightly, she thought. And she clutched her hands on the shaft of the spear as her heart raced a little. Ikala, if I was going to be rescued by anyone... She shook her head. This was not some fanciful highly romance tale. They're still in danger, and we can't warn them, she repeated. Remember these damn things get smarter every time we do something. I think they may even get smarter every time they eat more magic. I doubt that they're native, so Ikala won't know about them. The best chance we all have to survive is if we four can eliminate these creatures before anyone else runs afoul of them. If they do get nastier every time they eat something, everyone out there could become victims. For all we know, if they share intelligence as Aubrey said, they may share their power among each other as they die off. The fewer there are, the more powerful the individuals might become. She was afraid that Scan might think she was an idiot for even thinking the four of them could take on the Wyasa pack, as ill-equipped as they were. But he nodded. Are you listening to this, Drake? He called back into the cave. To every word, and I agree, came the reply. It's insane, of course, to think that we can do that, but we're used to handling insanely risky business, aren't we, old bird? We are. Scan had actually mustered up a grin. But Amber Drake wasn't finished yet. And what's more, I'm afraid that trait runs in both families, right, Tad? A gusty sigh answered his question. I'm afraid so, the young griffin replied with resignation. Like father, like son? Scan winked at her. The basic point is, we have four excellent minds and four bodies to work on this. Well, between your broken bones and our aching ones, we probably have the equivalent of two healthy bodies, rather than four. But that's not so bad. It could be worse. Blade thought about just a few of the many, many ways in which it could be worse, and nodded agreement. Of course, there are many, many ways in which it could be better, too. So, while those two are back there involved in patching and mending, let me get my sneaky old mind together with your resilient young one, and let's see if we can't produce some more cleverer tactics. He griff grinned at her, and to her surprise, she found herself grinning back. That's it, sir, Tad said from the back of the cave. That's all the weapons we have. Blade? There was surprise in her father's voice. I thought you said you didn't have a bow. I did. She left Scan for a moment and trotted back to the fire to stare at the short bow and quiver of arrows in surprise. Where did that come from? I brought it in my pack, Tad said sheepishly. I know you said not to bring one because you couldn't use it, but... I don't know. I thought maybe you might be able to pull it with your feet or something, and if nothing else, you could start a fire with it. Well, she still can't use it, but I can, Amber Drake said, appropriating it. He looked up at Scan and his son. 
You two get out there and start setting those traps before the sun goes down. We'll get ready for the siege. There would be a siege. Blade only hoped that the traps that the other two were about to set would whittle down the numbers so that the inevitable siege would be survivable. If the mother Wyasa had been angry over the loss of a single young, what would she be like when she lost several? Tad and Scan were going out to set some very special single traps, and do it now while the Wyasa were at a distance. They knew that the Wyasa had withdrawn, probably to hunt, because Blade and her father had used their empathic abilities to locate the creatures. It had been gut-wrenching to do so, but it had at least worked. They hoped that the Wyasa would be out of sensing range of small magics, because that was what they intended to use. The bait and trigger both would be a tiny bit of magic holding the whole thing together. That was why it needed Scan and Tad to do the work. They were physically stronger than Blade and her father, when the Wyasa ate the magic holding everything in place. Deadfalls would crush them, sharpened wooden stakes would plunge through them, nooses would snap around their legs, and the rocks poised at the edge of the torrent would tumble in, pulling them under the water. And for the really charming trap, another huge rockfall would obliterate the path and anything that was on it. They would have to be very, very clever. The magic had to be so small that the wiser would have to be on top of it to sense it. Otherwise it would eat the magic from a distance, triggering the trap without its killing anything. Meanwhile, Blade and her father gathered together every weapon in their limited arsenal for a last stand. It has to be now, she kept telling herself. The wiser are nibbling away at Tad, and they'll do the same to Scan. The more they eat, the stronger they get. We have to goad them into attacking before they're ready, and keep them so angry that they rely on their instincts and hunting skills instead of thinking things over. If we wait, there's a chance the next party will bumble right into them. That would be Ikala and Kinath, and the idea that either of those two could be in danger made a fierce rage rise inside her, along with determination to see that nothing of the kind happened. Spears, the long ones and the short, crude throwing spears that Amber Drake was making, with points of sharpened, fire-hardened wood. Those were hers, those and her fighting knife, which was just a trifle shorter than a small sword. Amber Drake would take the bow, his own fighting knife, and his throwing knives. She still had her sling, and that could be useful at the right time. There wasn't much, but it was all useful enough. When she divided it into two piles, hers and her father's, she sat down beside him at the fire to help him with the spears. He made the points, she fire-hardened them, until the pile of straight wooden stakes was all used up. Then she took a single brand from the fire, and he put it out. She went all the way to the back of the cave and started a huge new fire there, one of the objects being to make the Wyasa believe that they were farther back there than they actually were. She piled about half of their wood, the wettest lot around it. This wood was going to have to dry out before it caught, and she thought she had that timed about right. It's too bad this cave is stable, she thought wistfully. It would be nice to arrange to get them inside, then drop the ceiling on them. Well, in a way, they were going to do that anyway. She helped her father drag all of the rest of the driftwood that they had collected to the front of the cave, and arrange it along the barricade. There was quite a lot of it, more than she remembered. Tad had certainly been busy. And this had better work, because we're using up all of our resources in one attempt. What was it that Judith always told us? Never throw your weapon at the enemy? I hope we aren't doing that now. But being cautious certainly hadn't gotten them anywhere. Strange how it was the younger pair that was so cautious and the elder willing to bet everything on one blow. Periodically she or her father would stop, close their eyes, and open themselves to the wiser to check on their whereabouts. It was Amber Drake's turn to check when he cut his search short and put his fingers to his mouth to utter the ear-piercing whistle they had agreed would be the call-in signal. Scan came flying back low over the river, with Tad running on the trail a little behind him. At that point the gloom of daylight had begun to thicken to the darkness of night, and they were all ready to take their positions. Blade sent up a petition to the star-eyed one that this would all work. The star-eyed only helps those who help themselves, and those who have planned well don't need the star-eyed's help. Always remember that, Blade. If you haven't done your best, you have no reason to hope for the star-eyed's help if it still goes bad. She crouched down behind a screen of rock and dead brush, away from their safe haven of nights past, and waited, her spear thrower in one hand, three spears in the other. She hadn't had time to practice. She only hoped that she could hit somewhere in her targets, instead of off to one side of them. From where she crouched, she wouldn't have to make a fatal hit, just a solid one, and they would probably go into the river. 
There was nowhere for them to hide, even in the darkness, because it wasn't going to be dark, not completely. Scan had made a quick sortie across the river before they went off to set traps and had returned with rotten wood riddled with foxfire. Any time she saw one of the chunks of foxfire vanish, she was supposed to throw. They'd planned as well as they could. Now it was just a matter of waiting. And I never was very good at waiting. She kept quiet, trying not to fidget, and listened for sounds up the trail. Scan had an advantage over all of the others. He knew where each trap was, because he felt the mage energy, and he would know as they were triggered, because he would sense that too. Under any other circumstances, the tiny bits of energy he and Tad had invested in the triggers would have vanished in the overall flows of energies, but with nothing around to mask them, they glowed to him like tiny fires in the distance. And he tensed as he felt the first of them go out. That was a strangling noose. He wished he had Drake's empathic ability as well. It would be nice to know if their trap had gotten anything. They had to be careful to set things that worked differently though hopefully the pups would venture over here slowly and would be so greedy to get at the bits of magic that none of them would realise that the magic bits and the traps had anything to do with each other. The next one is a set of javelins, and if there's a group, it should take out several, and they'll be cautious after they spring that one. The javelins, hidden under the brush, were far enough away from the trigger that he was fairly certain that the pups would make no connection between the two. And there it goes. In his mind's eye, another little glowing fire went out. Two down, two to go. One trap working from above, one from in front. One takes out a single pup, one takes out several. No pattern there, and nothing in the way of a physical trigger to spot. The next trap would take out a single pup again, and it worked from the ground. That would be the foot noose. He felt his chest muscles tighten all over, as he watched that little spark of energy and waited for the pups to regain their courage. He knew that at least he and Tad were safe from detection tonight. They'd used up all but a fraction of their personal energies making the traps. There was nothing to distract the pups from the bait. Time crawled by with legs of lead, and he began to wonder if he and Tad had done their work a little too well. Had he discouraged the pups, or would the loss of several more goad them into enough rage to make them continue? Only Blade and Amber Drake knew the answer to that question and only if they had opened themselves up empathically again. Just when he was about to give up, when in fact he had started to stand, taking himself out of hiding, the third spark died. He crouched back down again, quickly. They all heard, or rather felt, the fourth trap go. It was the one that had originally been set with a crude string trigger that went into the cave. When it went, it would not only take several wires with it, hopefully, but it would have the unfortunate side effect of spreading rock out into the river, widening the shelf in front of the cave, but that couldn't be helped. The rocks under him shook as the wires had triggered the last trap, and he didn't need to be empathic to know that this final trap totally enraged them. Unlike the cries they had uttered until now, their ear-piercing shrieks of pure rage as the remaining members of the pack poured over the rocks were clearly audible over the pounding water. More than four. But it was too late to do anything other than follow through on their plan, with a scream of his own, he dove off the cliff right down on the last one's back. The head whipped around and the fangs sank into his shoulder, just below where the wing joined his body. He muffled his own screech of pain by sinking his own beak into the join of the creature's head and neck. The thing wouldn't let go. But neither would he. It tried to dislodge him, but he had all four sets of talons bound firmly into its shoulders and hindquarters. In desperation, it writhed and rolled and sank its fangs in up to the gum line. He saw red in his vision again, but clamped his beak down harder, sawing at the thing's flesh as he did so. He jerked his head toward his own keel, digging the hook of his powerful beak even further through hide, then muscle, then cartilage. The spine. He had to sever the spine. Amber Drake stood up on his tiny shelf of rock and fired off arrow after arrow into one wire sir that had been unfortunate enough to cross his blob of foxfire. The arrows themselves had been rubbed with phosphorescent fungus, so once the first one lodged, he had a real target. He throttled down any number of emotions as the wires came closer and closer. But strangely enough, now that he was fighting, he felt a curious, detached calm. His concentration narrowed to the dark shape with an increasing number of glowing sticks in it. His world constricted to placing his next arrow somewhere near the rest of those spots of dim light. Sooner or later, he would hit something fatal. He knew that he had, 
when the shape bearing the sticks wobbled to the edge of the water, wavered there for a moment, then tumbled in. He chose another as it crossed a blob of foxfire and began again. Tad was close enough to his father that he saw the difficulty Scan was in. At that point it didn't matter that it was not in the plan. He surged out of hiding and pounced, sinking his beak into the wire's throat and his foreclaws into its forelimbs. A gush of something hot and foul-tasting flooded his mouth, and the wire collapsed under Scan's weight. He let go, spitting to rid himself of the taste of the wire's blood, as Scan shook himself free of the creature's head and staggered off to one side. Tad guarded him as he collected himself, keeping the other wire at bay with slashing talons. Then he wasn't alone any more. His father was fighting beside him. Good job, Scan called. I owe you one. Then take the one on the left, Tad called back, feeling a surge of pleasure that brought new energy with it. Only if you take the one on the right, Scan called back, and launched himself at his next target. Tad followed in the same instant, as if they had rehearsed the manoeuvre a thousand times together. Blade's weapon was not as suited to rapid firing as her father's, and she had to choose her targets more carefully than he. He had a great many arrows, she had a handful of spears, and not all of them flew cleanly. But when she did connect, her weapon was highly effective. She sent three wires a tumbling into the river, and wounded two more, making them easier targets for Scan and Tad. Just as she ran out of short spears, she saw and sensed the moment that they had all been waiting for. The bitch Wyasa was herding her remaining pups before her into the cave the two humans and two griffins had abandoned. She obviously intended to reverse the situation on her attackers by going to ground in what should have been their bolt hole. She's going in, Blade shouted. She seized the longer of her two spears and jumped down to the ground. A moment later, her father joined her, and with Tad and Scan, they formed a half-circle that cut off the Wyasa from escape. The pups had clearly had enough, now that they were all in the cave, they were silhouetted clearly against the fire at the rear. The pups, about three of them, milled about their mother. They didn't like the fire, and they didn't want to face the humans and griffins either. The wiser bitch, however, was not ready to quit yet. She surged from side to side in the cave, never presenting a clear target, and snarled at her pups. It looked to Blade as if she were trying to herd them into something. She and Amber Drake edged up farther into the cave, following the plan. In theory, with the two weakest members of the party in plain sight, the bitch should do what they wanted her to. She's trying to goad them into a charge, Amber Drake shouted. Get ready! Blade grounded the butt of her spear against the rock, hoping against hope that she wouldn't have to use it. Now! Drake shouted, as the bitch herded her pups up onto the brush and rock barrier. At that signal, Scan and Tad used the last of their mage energy and ignited the oil-soaked wood of the barricade with a simple, small fire spell. With the fire already going at the back of the cave, there was a good draught going up the chimney. The flames swept back, and merged with the second fire at the rear. The cave was an oven, and the wiresa were trapped inside. The wiresa bitch turned and heaved herself at the barricade nearest Blade. Her dead, white eyes blazed rage as she stared at the human, and Blade felt her hatred burning, even without being open empathically. Amber Drake dropped his spear, it clattered to the ground as he seized his head in both hands. His knees buckled, and he fell in a convulsing heap. Without hesitation, Blade picked up her own spear, aimed, and threw. The bitch wiser took it full in the chest and continued forward, screaming defiance. She heaved up into the air, towering above all of them for a moment, and Blade was certain she was going to come over the barricade anyway. Blade's heart pounded in her ears. Only that sound, and the sound of the wiser's scream, louder than anything she had felt before. The wiresa fell forward, but didn't leap. The spear jutted from her chest only a quarter of its length in. She stumbled forward in shock. Her forelegs crumpled, and the butt of the crude spear struck the ground and drove itself in deeper. Blade fell into her crouch without hesitation, and groped for her fighting knife, but she could not take her eyes off the vision of the black wiresa pitching backwards to be consumed in flame. We won, Tad said for the hundredth time. As the rain washed wires of blood from the rocks, he locked his talons into another body and dragged it to the river to roll it in. Blade hoped that something in there would eat wires, and that the blasted things wouldn't poison the fish. After the flames had died down, they had all moved back into the cave to see what was left. Not much was recognisable compared to the bodies outside the cave, 
but the skulls of the charred wire so were easily broken off for later cleaning. The families of those people the creatures had killed were entitled to them, perhaps for a revenge ceremony during mourning, so the grisly task was done with solemn efficiency. Inside the rock was nicely warmed, and the two exhausted fathers had a good, comfortable place to lie down and get some rest. Meanwhile, she and Tad dragged their own weary bodies out into the rain again to clean up the mess. This is the last one, thank the gods, Blade said, as she hauled the last of the beheaded bodies to the river's edge. Together she and Tad shoved it in, and together they turned and walked back to the cave. Drake is burning some fish for you, Blade, Scan greeted them as they climbed over the rock barricade. Janille would not approve. By the way, both the other rescue parties are near enough for mind speech with me, so we won't have to eat fish much longer. Blade's heart surged with joy, and then her throat tightened as she realized just how close the others must have been last night. They could have walked right into the same kind of trap that my father did, she thought soberly. She'd been wondering ever since yesterday evening if they were doing the right thing by trying an all-or-nothing last stand. Now she knew they had been. When will they get here? Tad asked eagerly, as Blade accepted fish from her father with a smile of thanks. Tomorrow, probably. Your mother is thrilled, Blade. Tad, your mother and brother would be flying in here now if it weren't raining. Scan Griff grinned at all of them. I promised them that we would do our best not to melt before they got here. That was probably safe, Blade agreed. Did you tell them anything other than that we were all safe? Scan ground his beak and dropped his head. I confess. I told them everything while they were still far enough away that your mothers couldn't flay us alive for risking all our necks last night. He coughed. <coughs> I know my Janelle and I suspect Winterheart will react the same. Weary by the time they reach us... They will be so grateful that we are all right, that they will probably have forgotten that we took on all those wires by ourselves. Amber Drake winced. Maybe Janille will, but Winterhard won't, he said guiltily, and she'll never forgive me for acting like a hot-headed young fighter and standing on a ledge in the dark, firing arrows into the damn things. And if I actually admit that, I... Well, I was good at it. Blade patted his knee and smiled as a rush of love filled her heart. Don't worry, father, she said fondly. I'll protect you. For the first time in days, if not weeks, Tad lay on a ledge in the open, sunning himself. Finally, finally, the rains had lessened last night, and although the fog had appeared on schedule, the rain had not chased it away. It looked as if the weather was getting back to normal, Tad whooped and leaped off his ledge to gallop toward his brother. Keith arrowed in for a landing down on the recently added stretch of rock and gravel beach in front of the cave. A moment later, as Tad and his brother closed on each other for the graphonic equivalent of a back-slapping reunion, the mother's party appeared around the curve of the trail. Now it was Blade's turn to launch herself off the ledge and run straight into the arms of her mother while Amber Drake brought up the rear. Tad grinned at his twin as they watched his silver partner hugging her mother and even shedding a few tears. She was acting just as any normal human would in the same situation, and about time, too. Things settled down a little, and Winterheart paused to wipe a couple of happy tears as the second party rounded the bend. With a gasp, Blade broke off her conversation with her mother to run straight for the leader of the party. Ikala looked surprised, but extremely pleased when she threw her arms around him, and it would have taken an expert to determine if she kissed him first or he kissed her. Tad took a quick look at Amber Drake and Winterheart. They looked stunned, but gradually the surprise was being replaced by... Glee? Probably. Now they're finally going to get their wish after all. What is that all about? Keith gurgled. She's never done that before. Tad laughed. Oh, it's been a complicated mess, but I think I can explain it. Drake sees her as a real person now, not just as his daughter, his child. They fought alongside each other. Now she's... well... Now she knows who she is, that she's not a reflection of Drake or her mother, and that she doesn't have to work so hard at being their opposite. It's, well, she's free. Free to be herself. And you? Keith asked shrewdly. Tad laughed. After seeing father in action, I can't say I mind being the son of the Black Griffin anymore. And now he's fought beside me, and he knows there is more to me than obstacle courses and fatherly pride. Word will get around and then he will have to cope with being referred to as the father of that brave silver. I guess that's justice. Keith grinned and leaned against his brother. 
That should give us all some rest and freedom. Freedom, he thought with content. That's what it is, all right. Freedom. This concludes the Silver Griffin by Mercedes Lackey and Larry Dixon, narrated by Gary Furlong. Copyright 1996 by Mercedes R. Lackey and Larry Dixon. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Door Books Incorporated and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.